Thank you. Calling to order the June 28th meeting of the Academic Standards Committee. We'll go around and introduce ourselves. Mary Ann McKee, School Board. Jerry Grupp, School Board. Christine Meyerson, High School Teacher. Andrea Mandel, Holland Elementary School. Tim Kenny, Assistant Principal of Holland. Mary Desco, Director of K-12 Education. Uh, Raina Metha, Karen. Lisa Barnon, Volunteer. <laughs> Julie Eastburn, District Coordinator for Math. Sue Elliott, Assistant Superintendent. Matt Fredrickson, IT Director. Kyle McKessie, School Board. Great, thank you all. I understand we have three agenda items. Oh, I beg your pardon. And uh, remotely, we have with us Joe Hidalgo, School Board. Denise, on mute. I think I'm she here. Just... Sorry. <coughs> can you introduce yourself? Uh, it, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Hi, Denise Brooks here. Thank you all. Um, beginning with Grocery Code. Yep. Thank you. So we have uh, three agenda items this evening, two of which really focus on um, STEM. And our third agenda item focuses on a high level overview of our district climate survey. So uh, tonight we have um, three presenters who are going to talk about uh, the Girls Who Code program that we ran as a pilot here uh, this spring. Uh, Dr. Julie Eastburn and um, uh, Ms. Raina Metha and also Lisa Farnan. And I'll let them introduce themselves as well and, and talk a little bit about the program. So Julie, I'll turn it over to you or whoever is first. Okay, we're going to have Raina sure. start with uh, an overview of Girls Who Code sure. and why we need it. Yes. So first, I would just want to thank the board, the Academic Standards Committee, for giving us this opportunity to present. Um, I also personally want to thank Dr. Elliott and Dr. Eastburn for um, taking the important steps to move this initiative forward. Um, and I know Dr. Frazier is not here, but I wanted to thank him for our quarterly couple uh, therapy that he provided. <laughs> um, really kind of openness and um, honesty and kind of helping us get through some of the challenges that we know we have. Um, and get through them to like actually get things moving forward. Um, a little bit about myself, I am an in-house attorney at PNC Bank, um, and I'm also the vice chair of our Diversity and Inclusion Council at PNC Bank. Um, a huge focus of ours in our DNI efforts, and it's, I would say 50% of my time is spent on that, is gender equity. Um, and a lot of the kind of programming and initiatives that we move forward are related to gender equity, trying to teach even senior level women, you know, confidence, how to be brave and take risks and not fear failure and set that other comfort zone. Um, and so we at a corporate level have been very focused on this. Um, also getting men engaged in that discussion and trying to create allies for women in the workplace. Um, however, as much as kind of we do that work at that level, um, we'll never catch up if our girls are left out of our future workplace. Um, all of the issues of gender equity will persist. Um, so for someone like myself, I have three kids, two of them are girls, I have a two-year-old girl and a five-year-old girl, um, and I don't want them to be working on the same issues that I'm working on when they enter the workforce 10, 15 years from now. Um, so, and on an even more macro level, I don't want my daughters and my son to kind of be living in a world where all of our technology is created by men. Um, you can kind of see the kind of imbalance that would create in society, and something that, if that were the case, we can't escape that. Um, I read a study uh, that was done by Accenture, um, and it said that girls get socialized out of technology and STEM by the third and fourth grade. Um, and they can't envision themselves in those types of roles um, because they don't have necessarily role models at that level um, to, to get them interested. Knowing this, I reached out to a friend of mine, Rachel Sajani. She's the founder of an organization called Girls Who Code. Um, we had a very frank discussion, and she told me about the great work she's doing. I kind of was following on yeah, usually what she was doing, but she said, Raina, we're, we're, we're developing a third through fifth grade program. Um, if you're interested, you know, if you're, I'll, you know, you're all ready to have your school district pilot it. So with Julie and Dr. Elliott's help, we brought it to Council Rock. Um, and we're amongst a handful of school districts across the country that are piloting this. Um, and it's given us the ability to provide feedback to girls who go to be able to kind of tailor the program well for a rollout 
fall to the entire country. Um, and so that's not only a great opportunity for our kids, but it's also a great opportunity for our community and our school district to kind of be a leader in tech uh, education. Um, so now that we're kind of going into the presentation, so six, the emphasis of us kind of wanting 65% of our children entering primary school today will ultimately end up working in jobs that currently don't exist. And that's really because of technology and how it's really speeding up. Computing skills and coding at the core are the most sought after skills in the American job market. The industry's rate of job creation in the U.S. is now three times the U.S. national, uh, national average. Um, after school computer programs are critical to boost our student curiosity and commitment to computing. So this kind of is very telling, and this really talks about the opportunities that are, are available to our girls if we focus on this. Um, programs like Girls to Code can help increase the number of women in computing, so you'll see at the top, by 3.9 million by 2025. That will lift their share from 24%, but it is currently, to 39% of the computing workforce to generate $299 billion in additional cumulative earnings. The greatest impact will come if we start now um, in the junior high level and even earlier um, and sustaining that interest throughout their education. So, you know, women in computing more than triple by 2025 if we start early. Uh, computing is where the jobs are and where they will be in the future, but our girls currently are being left behind. In 1995, 37% of Computing jobs are held by women. In 2017, that's only 24%. If we do nothing in 10 years, that number will drop to 22%. Uh, Girls of Code was founded in 2012 with a single mission to close the gender gap in technology. Uh, they're building the largest pipeline of future female engineers in the US. Uh, they have three focuses in their programs. Uh, capabilities for providing learning opportunities to deepen computer science skills and confidence. Uh, career, they're creating clear pathways into the computing workforce and community. They're fostering supportive sisterhood of peers and role models to help grow to code students and alumni persist and succeed. Uh, and it's having a great impact. 90,000 girls have been taught across the United States, uh, approximately 5,000 colleges. <coughs> Of the program. Uh, those that have already declared their majors are choosing to major in computer science or related fields that are 15 times the national average. Um, and the outcomes are telling. 40,000 girls who code, well, there's 40,000 girls who code alumni, um, and that's kind of quadrupling every year. 75% uh, of the club girls report being more likely to take a computer science class after participating in the club. 65% of club girls say they were more likely to major or minor in computer science in college because of girls who code. And 65% of club girls say they're more likely to pursue a career in technology because of girls who code. Um, kind of what kind of explains to me is that I feel like if we bring this program to the larger kind of house rock audience, you know, we can create a hub of girls who have learned technology, who are interested in technology, and Make sure our girls are kind of the tech leaders in not only Pennsylvania, but in uh, the country if we give them the tools to be successful. So this is, I think, a really important initiative, not just for now, but for the future. Now I'm going to hand it over to Julie. Julie, before you begin, Ed Tate. <coughs> He's muted, but I just wanted to make note that Ed Tate is joined yeah. via Google Hangout. I am. Thank you. Very good. Increase your volume a little bit, Ed, but you're good. Thank you. Okay, so um, after talking to um, Meta for, for many hours on the phone together, um, it became evident to me that this was really a program that we needed to bring into Council Rock to expose more females to computer science. And we looked at um, some of the, the programs. We actually were picked to pilot their grades three to five curriculum in uh, two of our elementary schools. So um, you can see up on the, on the screen kind of the differences across the grade levels. Um, in grades three to five, it really is learning the computer science language. There was um, a book that the girls had where they could actually start to learn the language of a computer programmer and, 
and start to talk in that, that language. Um, and that came free along with um, and being involved in the program. And then in grades six to 12, um, in, in grades three to five, they did a little bit of programming with Scratch. Um, they didn't have a big project to work on, but they did, um, they did use Scratch and start to create projects and learn how to, to you know, code. Um, in grades six to 12, this was where they really started to use um, their laptops and desktops to actually um, come up with a plan and implement a plan uh, although we only had it for a short period of time in all schools, so it was kind of hard to get that total plan completed, but it was a great start to kind of get our feet wet. Um, so it's designed for students with a wide range of computer science experience. Um, girls came into coding without having really any coding experience, so it really um, is not meant for students that already have experience. Um, in some clubs, there were girls that had no experience sitting next to girls that had experience in other computer languages. And they were, in the end, by the end, you were able to see them both helping and pushing each other along. Um, and the nice thing is that um, girls who code advertise is that the volunteers don't need to have any computer science background. Um, I think the people that worked in the clubs would say you probably need a little bit of experience. And there was a lot of um, upfront planning on the teacher's part to get to know the program. But um, it wasn't that you had to be fluent in a computer language. I'm sorry, I wrote Scratch. That's the computer language? Yes, yes, yes. It's a program at MIT. It's a program at MIT. And it's, it's really an educationally based computer language. I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Object oriented graphical. So basically, the modern logo. Concepts. Kind of like logo, but with graphics. Okay. It's, it's, oh, it's, we have, um, it's, it's district wide. We have kids in first grade using it, playing kids in the elementary schools, um, all the way through seniors. And some of the projects that they submit for the national competitions, I don't think we've ever participated in those, but if you go to Scratch's website and look, some of the programs are just, they're amazing. They're animated, they're animations. And you can do all this stuff just driving not actually not writing code, but you've got to understand the logic, you have to understand, you know, all of them. That's just the additional logic looping, if yeah. that else, yeah. Mm -hmm. We used it in the STEM research class in the high school last year. So our actual implementation in Council Rock this year was in grades three to five. We had Rolling Hills and Richboro elementaries both participating. Um, they used the book, and then they were starting to discuss words like wireframes and storyboards and strings and loops and variables. So they were starting to get familiar with computer science language. It was only about a five or six week program, um, depending on the, the time that that the facilitator had in, in her schedule, but um, the students were starting to use those words as part of their vocabulary when they were sitting in class. And although they may not own it as their own language yet, they at least have the prerequisite, should they go to another language, they've heard what a loop is, they heard what a variable is, they may not remember it per se, but they at least know that, hey, that's a computer science word. Um, and they explored Scratch, and one of the teachers actually used, um, had all of the lessons set up on Google Classroom, so they were able, students were able to access it at any time um, on Google Classroom. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa Farnan, who ran our middle school girls who code group to talk about what specifically she did in her group. Right, so uh, just a tiny bit of introduction. I'm not from the Council Rock District. I'm actually just a couple towns over, but um, so my name's Lisa Farnan. I recently retired from IBM. I have a degree in engineering and industrial engineering undergrad and then a master's in computer science and I have lived <laughs> what you're describing in the workforce and I just think we need frankly we need men and women um, understanding what careers in technology are so that they could even consider them and then hopefully pursuing them so um, I came to this just by my passion to really try to attract more students to the field in general and and to try to attract more girls in particular um, just one stat for you on the engineering side, just to kind of demonstrate the need to, to give it a little extra emphasis here. Um, nationally, and I, forgive me, I can't remember the, the source, but nationally, girls in undergraduate school drop out of engineering because it's too hard with higher GPAs than men who graduate. So part of it is the skills but part of it is this confidence, learning how to fail and get right back on the horse again, seeing people that 
you feel like you you could be like them. So it's it's not just the coding; it's the whole kind of experience of building confidence, trying new things, failing, and getting back up and trying something new. So with that in mind, I uh, had the pleasure of hosting at Holland Middle School, which was just a complete joy. Um, so we had a, a fairly small group of girls. Um, they created an impact project. Um, we left it really open and loose. This was in, I think, all but one case. It was their first exposure to coding of any sort. So they could pick a topic that was of interest to them. Um, we kind of honed in on a subject area, and then each of the girls picked their own impact project, um, which was basically, what are you going to work on over the course of the next uh, several weeks? It went really well. In fact, we were ending and they were, I said, okay, you know, in two weeks we're gonna be ending, they were crestfallen. So they begged and they were like, can we come over the summer? Can we do this? You know, how about, and I'm like, well, you know, you don't know how schools work and no, but we do, were able to add two more sessions. Really it just kind of there like, you know, can, can we go a little longer? So it was really, um, I think, got some great traction with them in terms of interest. Um, the nice thing about the curriculum, which Marina uh, alluded to as well, is it's, of course, it's coding. So they were using Scratch and they were doing programming and creating backgrounds and, and Scratch is called sprites, which are your objects and the objects were looping and uh, you know, making decisions or logistically, you know, where are they going to be positioned on the screen. But the other really nice thing was um, I was able to expose them to just some basic industry practices, like uh, they roll their eyes when I say, what's your minimum viable product? So in the industry, MVP is just, you know, what's the least amount you can create and show so that people understand your concept in the real world, so you can go out and get funding, or you can have people make decisions about, do you want A or B? Um, things like dot voting, which is just, you know, we've got a whole bunch of, in, in, in the industry, you know, we've got a whole bunch of features, functions everybody wants. You know, let's say everybody gets 10 votes, go around the room, make your 10 votes, we're gonna shorten the list, and then we're gonna talk through so they got to practice that, and we talked about how you know you can use that in other aspects of life that have nothing to do with coding. Um, other things um, at the end, we had a kind of meet up at the end of every session, kind of practicing. Okay, what do we go over? What are challenges? What are we going to do next time? So just some really basic, you know, easy to implement industry practices were also kind of brought through by the result of the curriculum. Um, they they did learn Scratch. They didn't learn it in great detail. But they learned, uh, they're familiar with loops. We even did exercises without the computer. One day, Scratch was down the entire session. So we practiced looping and instructions, you know, with, with uh, just, you know, literally our bodies and Simon Says kind of things. But, um, and I think what they, they learned was the language itself, but they also, as you were alluding to with the third through fifth graders, they learned the language. So if they're in another language, they're going to go, I need a loop. How do you do a loop in this language? So it may be a different syntax or, you know, kind of a different software, but I know I need a loop, or I know my sprite keeps running off the screen and I have to find a way to ground him when he gets to the edge of the screen so that he comes back and I can have him do the next activity. Um, and then really what was really so impressive, and I just was so thrilled to see the girls do this, was they were working very collaboratively. You know, kind of the image in their mind was this, you know, lonely person sitting in a closet coding by themselves, and that's just not it at all in terms of real life. So we talked about how, you know, most of the people I worked with I never expected to meet. They were across the globe in multiple time zones. Um, so you guys need to kind of help each other. And they really did, you know, when they would ask a question, uh, I wouldn't jump to answer it. I would look around and say, hey, did anybody have this background? And sure enough, someone else who had gone through the background change would kind of jump in and you could see her kind of getting a little more confident. And the next session, the person who learned at that time was like demonstrating it to the other girl. So it was, it was really great to see them kind of work together and, and I think uh, we had, you know, we talked about failures, like, you know, things weren't working the way we thought they should. Um, so I was really pleased to see kind of what they commonly call soft skills, which are all really important in, in industry, uh, combined with the technical skills. And it was a complete joy. I thought they did a great job. And, um, and I think they all got enough of an exposure to kind of really start to think about a number of them were heading to high school, you know, what, what should I be choosing? What might I be interested in? Those kind of things. And the amazing thing was I, I came to watch their last presentations on the, the last day. They each got up and did a presentation. And even in front of five or six of their peers, you could tell that they were very nervous to get up in front of their peers. But they, they all did it, and they all did a great job showing what it was that they were able to do. And the amazing part before that was I was, you know, they had 15 minutes to kind of get everything together and decide what they were going to do. And watching them helping each other was amazing. The, the conversation that went on, the, the peer coaching and tutoring that went on was absolutely amazing. And Lisa really stood in the background as a facilitator, not as this is what you need to do now and this is what you need to do now. They kind of were like 
talking across computers to each other. It really was an amazing, amazing thing to watch. And it all, all those soft skills were developed in six weeks. Yeah, well, it like, ended up being like eight, eight, eight weeks by the time. <laughs> Actually, ten, but yeah, but in a very short period of time. Right. With girls who, two of them knew each other, two of them were sisters, so two pairs walked in knowing each other, but the rest of them How had, many were there? There were six total. Six total. So just, um, since I know we have limited time, and I've probably already gone over my 20 minutes, um, <laughs> just to talk about some of the other coding op opportunities. Um, the first thing I do want to say is, Although the club is entitled Girls Who Code, it is not to the exclusion of gentlemen. Um, if there's any young men that want to join uh, Girls Who Code, they certainly can. The focus is um, a female focus. So, um, you know, the collaborative projects that they may work on would be, um, you know, perhaps the examples would be more female based, but it certainly does not exclude um, young men from joining. So please don't see this as an exclusion. Uh, but I also wanted to point out some other clubs around the, um, the district that um, gave kids exposure to, to coding. Um, in Holland Elementary, we had uh, six students that were using code.org. We had, and I've talked to Raina about this a little bit, we had a couple issues with um, getting credentials to log on to Girls Who Code. Um, but uh, we've talked to Girls Who Code, and they're, they're working on streamlining that a little bit. Um, at Hillcrest, they had 25 students, 13 boys, or I'm sorry, 13 girls and 12 boys who had a coding club that ran pretty much most of the year. Um, and then at Welsh, there were six girls. <laughs> Many of the libraries um, had the hour of code, uh, particularly in the upper grades, but I know many of the, the lower grades did. Um, kids are getting exposure to coding in our middle school tech programs. Um, they're also uh, part of our primary typing program has a coding uh, aspect to it. I can't guarantee that you know all students have delved into that yet, but there is the, the possibility to expand our coding through that program. And then we also have um, courses at the high school, which I did um, when I went to Holland Middle, did talk to the young ladies about, you know, let's get some more women represented in those courses. But we do have accelerated computer science one and two. We have computer science A, which is just our typical Java programming, and just um, new starting next year, we have a computer, AP computer science principles, which really goes beyond just the hardcore programming and talks about the applications and um, use of um, technology skills beyond just Java programming. How are the um, schools jumping? Um, uh, I guess the elementary schools, I kind of threw it out to all of the elementary math specialists to see who who had um, some time after school to, to donate. Um, so it was kind of thrown out that way. We picked um, Rolling Hills and Richboro because we thought those were populations that might um, want more access to, to coding. Um, Holland Middle and Newtown Middle, um, choosing between that. Richboro Middle thought that um, given the time that we were starting and closing down a school was just Right. A little much. Um, <laughs> I was just curious to see. It, it seems like most of the exposure is on one side of the district. It is interesting. As opposed to the other. And I don't, I'm just curious if that's interest based or. We did. Um, they did get a little a group up and running at Solfinestone. Um, they did. Um, Rolling Hills also had another little group running. So there were little pockets. Mm -hmm. If I couldn't get exact numbers, I, I didn't include in the presentation. But yes, you're right. Um, it was more on this, the southern side. And it's not a criticism. I was just curious as to how it worked is, out that way. Is there any thought? I understand it's a national program. Forgive me, Drew. Is there any thought that the title is Girls Who Code? I'm amazed that there were equal number of boys and girls participating. I understand the deficit. No, that was it. That was at Hillcrest. At Hillcrest. Yeah, that Correct. wasn't. I, I won school. Right. And I, my question is, do we do we think it is a barrier to entry for boys? Um, right. So I, I I think the answer is <laughs> because most boys would say girls who code. Code is for it, girls. It would be it would be a natural barrier to entry. Right. So I, I just I appreciate it's a national program, but I, I wonder from that perspective, doesn't need to run under that title. I I understand, admire the intent, I but there's that equity in, basis within the district. I, I think um, given the the stats that Raina, you want to address? Yeah. Well, no, apparently not. <laughs> which, which, sorry, in, I the context, in the context of this message, I'm going to let her do oh, it. <laughs> In the context of um, empowered women, I'm going to look to her to answer. 
that um, as Julie actually mentioned, there's no there's no exclusion of boys, but the mission of Girls in Code is to close the gender gap in technology, and that that gap is huge. I mean, it's 24% women, and I can't I'm not whatever the rest, 76% men. Um, the reason we're starting early is because the studies have shown that girls get socialized out of computer science and technology by the third and fourth grade. And that's because they can't see themselves in a hoodie, in a closet, you know, and they don't have role models who are already working at software companies and technology companies to look at and say, I can be her. Um, so for, for, from Girls Who Code's perspective and my perspective, it's the girls that need the extra attention right now. And that might change in the future, but it's the girls that need it because they're, we need to make sure they don't get socialized out of being interested in computer science and technology. I see your it, point. It, it, but, it, you know, it, the other way to look at it is you could look at, I, I don't know the district's stats at all, but you could look at the stats in the AP courses and see, and if they are yes, fairly I even, see. then you don't need any extra emphasis on the female side. If you find that they're highly male, they then in a good way, somehow, you could argue they are being attracted, not through a separate after-school program. Uh, but I see your point. I, I don't disagree. It's, it's I, I just my my perspective on it is you know I, I hear what you say about they don't see or they see people. They, they should come to my office where the application specialists who are female or you know actually work better in my mind work better collaboratively on uh, collaboratively on some than others, which is also an interesting perspective because many of the um, boys who code um, the historic perspective on that was not having the social skills. So the deficit among boys who code was historically that image. So it seemed to sound like the Unabomber the way you described yeah, it. But, like, yeah. but, <laughs> but, but the guys who work alone, and I mean, if you know, must know, if we all know the definition or the derivation of the word hack, you know, the word hack mm -hmm. was competitive, which was you develop something in 15 lines of code, and I did it in 13, and I beat you. And it was competitive nature, work independently. So, so those soft skills on boys yes. are the same soft skills that are missing on girls. I don't that, disagree at all. I, hear, I understand yeah. it, but this is, I, I understand the principle of the, of the program, yeah. and I'll shut up and maybe I'll and look I, at your I, husband I, in I, a second. But, <laughs> but I, I understand the principle yeah. of the program, and, and it's great that the program has that Derivation, but as a school district, my perspective on it is to to rise all to raise all boats yeah. or to, to have all boats float under the bridge in the same way. I, I think any personally, I think any computer science program should incorporate soft skills, and so that our boys and our girls are learning them. <coughs> Term meeting, but we normally have a public <laughs> comment later. I mean, I'm going to just add. Well, but you were going to comment anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From the male's perspective, I can tell you I felt the same way when I first heard about it. And then I asked my son, who is eight years old, and he was just like, I don't care if this girl is a code. So it's, the, it's one of those things where I think in our mindset, maybe we're still caught up in a different time zone than maybe your kids are going in a different way. And it's one experiment, and I look at this as probably a really good experiment. I found it fascinating. What I actually found fascinating was the commentary. I forgot the first thing, but that Lisa's observation was that. The people in the program wanted to continue, and the program was going to break up because I, I wondered about that if it was only six, but they didn't say, "Can we meet at someone's house to do it?" They did. And okay, I said well no. then that. <laughs> you said no. well, you're four days for your mom. Okay. I had, I had dreams that we were going to open the school for that movie. No, 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 we're not doing that. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Because that's, you know, that to to, to the point of of fostering independence and fostering continuing because in in some ways. Again, as an outside observer, it looks like we that we're stymieing what would have been natural growth, and, and and that's almost contrary because the classic boys would have gone home to keep going. Right. No, no. They. I didn't. I just said that the girls who code this program would not continue. Okay. Like okay. I was not going to have them to my home or go to. Oh them. no, 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 no. Especially in light of all the paperwork I signed to be a volunteer. Good job. <laughs> Trust me, you know. I mean, FBI I was proud of that. Thank yeah, you. I think too. We're, the, the second presentation that you're going to hear tonight really speaks to when you're talking about equity and, and access for all, you know, our, our STEM committee, and I don't want to steal all of their thunder away from what they have to say as well, but 
you know, we're as a district really looking at, particularly at the elementary level when it comes to STEM and STEM related fields, which is going to include coding and computer science. How do we make sure that every single kid has access so that when they are ready to make a decision about more of an interest that they want to pursue further, they're not ruling out STEM related fields because they haven't had enough exposure and engagement in those fields. So that's something that you know, you're going to hear a little bit more about um, later. And from an industry perspective, it's, it's that decision to gun and go for pre-algebra or algebra. That's, that's where, that's from an, and again, I'm not an educator, but that's, the, that's where you start to hop on or off that path or, or have an easier road pursuing a STEM career. It starts to accelerate and you don't stay with it, you don't stay on. The one point that was in your statistic, which I'm fascinated by, now I have to go home and do research, which was what changed in 95? That made the drop off. And I have a theory on that. And my theory, you saw the movie Hidden Figures for the NASA program, which was when it changed from being administrators of the systems to being the programmers. And I'm wondering if there was a change around 95 with the acceptance of systems more on the desktop that changed it from a centralized system to decentralized. But that's where it fell apart. Yeah, I don't really answer I can answer the question. Or I, I could jump in too, because I worked for Accenture in 95. So I graduated from college and was recruited. I worked at Accenture. I worked in you know, technical consulting, technical architect architecture, and all that stuff for eight years. And I know I, I left kind of for a lot of family reasons. But um, I ultimately left was because I didn't want to be the partners, the female partners at Accenture, even though I was aligned with mentors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I had, you know, I always say, like, because people say, well, why did you leave? And, you know, we work for Accenture, you work seven days a week and nonstop, and we travel, and it's crazy. But, and I loved it, and I loved the process, and I loved that way of thinking. But when I was in my eighth year, and I had my mentor partner, and I turned to her, and we were working at, like, nine o'clock on a Friday night, and she was not going home and not going home and not going home, and I said to her, Gosh, Judy, you can go home. You know, you're a partner on the project. She was like, you know, when I was your age, I would work, I would drink 16 diet cokes a day. And I was like, that's crazy. That's more than one diet coke an hour. <laughs> and I was calculating a 12 hour work day. And she looked at me and she goes, No, Christine, that's 16 hours of work a day. You know, and so it was that type of lifestyle that I saw. And she, there were maybe two female partners. Mm -hmm. And it was that that really changed my mind, and that was so by, cost, by 2003, so cost, I just didn't cold, see anyone. The cost of breaking the class ceiling was you never really broke it, you had to keep pushing against it. Yes, yeah. yeah, you know, I thought if I'm going to have children, I'm going to be in the hospital delivering my children and taking and phone calls. Yeah, and, that's you know, true. I mean, that's, that's, that's 1995. I'm going to just jump in. Yeah. Historically, 1995 is when the spatial program was slated to end. So it was the decline of centralized space agency. And you started to see the differentiation of private agencies. They were nascent at the time, but NASA as a whole, as a place for women to go, started to kind of break apart. Yeah. So I know we want to get through the rest of the, of the presentation <laughs> and then see if any other board members have any questions or comments. And then if, um, if we want to, Miriam, we can open up for any comments about this particular presentation before we move on to the next one. So, Julie, are you? So I just want to quickly talk about um, where we're planning on going for next year. Um, our goal <laughs> is to continue with the existing programs that we have up and running and, and um, to get girls who code into all of our elementary schools so that all of our students can be um, exposed to that. Um, we want to continue to expose students to coding in other after school programs and to, as, as Dr. Elliott uh, mentioned, start offering experiences during the school day for kids also, or more experiences. Um, interestingly, we um, use First in Math in many of our elementary schools and they have a new coding instruction component to their program. So um, elementary teachers will be getting some training for that in August in our in-service so that they can start using that with students. So there'll be many opportunities for, or many more opportunities, not enough, but many more opportunities for coding. And um, we are going to continue the Girls Who Code um, 
through um, the Title IV grant funds. May I ask, um, you just said we use first in math in many of our elementary schools. Well, the good news is um, pending budget approval, which has that occurred yet? Mm -hmm. Oh, it has occurred. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, we will be purchasing uh, first in math for all third and fourth grade students because fluency is such a huge component of mathematics education and we find um, students are struggling with, with fluency. We've made a decision that we need to do something different to increase fluency. So we've purchased um, first in math to build fluency in grades three and four. So all students in grades three and four will have access to first in math. But I didn't realize that not everybody <laughs> had access to first in math. It kind of has gone for a while. Um, we were providing access in grades three and four, and mm -hmm. then there were some, some budget difficulties and that got cut. And then it was um, some PTOs pay, pay for it. Um, some schools have, um, you know, they'll collect money for parents who want their child to participate. Um, so it's, it, it's in many pockets of our district but it's not in all pockets. Yeah, I don't like that. I know. Well, that's I'm not I'm criticizing. I, I'm not criticizing at all. But I, I, I don't like. I feel like that's giving opportunities to it's some awesome. who have a better PTO or greater body of people from which to raise funds and, and putting other kids at a disadvantage. It's the system, and I understand that it's not critical. So. Any questions? I have one last appeal. Then I'll shut up. I promise. No, you won't. <laughs> I, don't I, don't even know. I can be a politician. But the, uh, it is, you know, so we were talking about equity. There's also another component, of this, which I think is fascinating, which is uh, there, there's another group of persons in our schools who graduate who have skills in the space but have trouble getting employment. And that's uh, children with disabilities, and specifically children who are on the autism spectrum, uh, specifically Asperger's. Uh, so we have a number of children who have those who those soft skills would be marvelous. That doesn't work in grade three to five. We're we have a bunch of other challenges there, but it is an interesting. It would not prick this girls of code. I don't have a better catchy name that wouldn't be really. <coughs> but um, it's an interesting perspective. If, if, uh, when I have people, I have people in the, who are residents of the community who would be eager to uh, partner with that. To uh, you know, as we have kids who go beyond 18 to start doing that partnership around coding, which is a lifelong skill. Um, yeah, I know Microsoft is working on an initiative now. Um, they hired a chief accessibility officer and decided that autism was a good disability to focus on to bring into Microsoft to work on real teams. So like I said, those soft skills are really important to work on teams with people with those types of disabilities. You know, who's leading those teams it has to be someone with really good So as you speak to the people that Girls who code. I keep thinking there's a company in there. Uh, and they want to come back to, you know, if there's any, I'll put them in touch with people locally. There's uh, people who want to do it. Great. Thank you. I'm going to reach out to our board members who are with us um, electronically. Any questions or comments from you on the presentation? Yeah, I have a question. I was just going to say that I. I think it's terrific when people pursue grants, but in this case with this program, if the pursuit of grants isn't successful, I hope you come back to the administration, the board, because clearly the board really likes this program. So congratulations. Well, and I'll clarify the grant. So Title IV is um, a federally funded grant. It isn't a grant that we pursued to um, be able to do this. It's actually one of the four main uh, federal grants through, um, through ESSA that um, the federal government awards money to states and it's on a, a needs basis and, and a formula basis. So we were fortunate this year with Title IV to receive an increase in our funding. The grant itself is focused on uh, very broadly, a well-rounded education is kind of the overarching um, umbrella that is the focus of that grant that gives districts a lot of flexibility in how to use the funds. And as uh, uh, Dr. Eastburn and I talked about how Girls Who Code was going and looking at wanting to continue it, um, I had um, anticipated an increase in our Title IV funding uh, and felt that it was this was a good use of those federal dollars to be able to continue this program. Great. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. You're welcome.
I think Joe, did you? Yeah, real real quick. I just was I was surprised that um, first in math wasn't offered to all students, and I'd be curious to see who doesn't have it. Um, but as far as the program's concerned, I'm all for it. It sounds great that we pilot things like this. Uh, my question was, if there's any other reach out programs that we do besides this, uh, when it comes to uh, coding and stuff like that, to the elementary students. I know that, um, and I can't speak very well to it, but I know that um, some of the, the science clubs at the high school go out and do um, programs in the elementary for, um, for students in, in the STEM area. I'm, I'm not an expert in that area, but I know that Maybe I can speak to that, um, Mr. Doggo. My name is Andrea Mann, and I've been acquainted with Fred Bauer. We both are fortunate enough to take advantage of a lot of NASA opportunities in our off time. So what we did this year, um, we combined our efforts, and I brought his, he was kind enough to share his students in the Hunch program with the elementary students, which boiled down to the fifth and sixth grade students. So what that did was almost like the girls who code, um, it was very um, uh, equally opportunity, let's put it that way. There were a good amount of boys and girls in there. Um, so those kids would come down to the elementary school once a week, bringing their projects with them, just giving them the whole scope and sequence of exactly what they had to do and presenting it in a manner like, here's the problem that we had to solve as engineers. So coding, we didn't quite get that far, but it was a great um, tease for these fifth and sixth grade students to see wait, I can do that in high school? They had no idea. So, um, in fact, at Holland Elementary, our program always has been as it's almost like a feeder. We want to make sure that we at least tickle the imaginations and creativity and curiosity of the youngest students down to second grade to make sure that they're aware that if their opportunity is there, they're more than welcome to take it. And that includes students of all abilities. So we've opened our doors to every student in the school for that. So it did work that way, and it was, it was fun. Like Great. This. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. And Mrs. Brooks, any questions or comments? Uh, just a comment. First of all, I just want to thank you. It's great to have an opportunity, you know, to have a, a, um, a way to see these kinds of things that are happening in the schools. I actually was fortunate enough to be able to go to Rolling Hills and see a, um, some of this in action. The other thing that's fantastic is just this ability to um, you know, engage community members and bring like all the talents and strengths that we have here to just help advance students in so many different ways. So just a real huge thank you to everybody. And now my dog Lola is saying hello to everybody. So I'm gonna go back on mute. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, I'm sorry, excuse me. My name is Gabby, I'm a Dr. Weissman. I'm a parent of the I have two boys. But I'm so excited to hear that we have programs like this. I'm so excited to hear that we care about gender equity. And uh, I love the name. I love the name. Please keep that name. Because it's not just about teaching girls that they can code. It's about teaching boys that girls can code. <laughs> I think that's key. It's changing that idea, that way of thinking that we have carried for so long. And you know what you mentioned about the uh, university where these girls go, and they're probably the only one in a class of 60 to 70 men. And then they have a professor who's probably prejudiced or biased. I have a that they need to eat. I mean, it takes a strong character, and it gets to, it could get to a point that they can say, hey, I have not to deal with these, with these prejudices, with these stereotypes, and these bias. So I'm hoping that we change that mindset, not just with the girls, uh, but also with the boys who are seeing that you know, girls are capable, they can learn math, that they're probably dear to girls. Um, I do have a question. Um, you said that you are doing mentoring as part of this program. Are there any conversations about these, about the challenges that the girls face or will face in the future, about biases, about stereotypes, and how to combat them? Because I think that could be key. You know. I think that's kind of built into the curriculum. I'll at least speak to that. Um, it, so, again, the, the children are fairly young. So we want to put a positive, like, you know, we're trying to attract them. Um, so part of the curriculum starts every session. We start with a video um, of a successful female who quite typically, 
you know, it was great diversity, um, talks about their experience and talks about their challenges, not in great detail. So we didn't spend, you know, a whole lot of time in full discussion mode, but there was questions that I asked afterwards related to the video. I was, you know, five minutes or less, you know, and kind of, um, and they usually related to why was this person attracted to this? What hurdles did they face? So there was an exposure to that kind of discussion for sure. And, and the videos were chosen by, they were part of the curriculum. So I chose to go right with them, I liked them, and, and they really presented a really nice space of just a, a broad variety as well of, you know, we had a, one a woman embeds fashion, embeds technology into her fashion. So that was like something that, you know, people don't typically think of unless you happen to be a huge fan of the, the gospel awards or something. Uh, and then others were related to uh, helping uh, persons uh, after a natural disaster. Another one related to um, helping persons with disabilities. So the, the videos did a nice job of touching on that, maybe introducing the concept. Um, didn't hit it real hard, but definitely. And then they were quite aware of, um, they were just, I mean, I'll just be honest with you. They were quite aware that um, there's not many not many females doing this. I, that wasn't anything I had to really introduce to them. So yeah, one more thing around why it's called Girls Code. And as I was going to the same, Processes as you were going. But what I realized in anything you try at first, especially in computer science, and, and we're at this level of school, school age, is that you need to create a critical mass. And if you can figure out whatever we can create the critical mass, not only from maybe male students that are all probably more tend to you know, get programmed because they play video games. Right now, the home will probably play beat soccer with my kid. So they're always exposed to video games and stuff like that, where girls are not. But this way, you can get girls to create a critical mass within the school district. Then it creates a, a significant amount of demand. And when you start having parents call up you guys up and say, hey, how come my boys are not able to do this? We've achieved the goal. You know, that's when you're like, okay, now we, we know there's a critical mass. We have enough data to show that this works, that computer science, you can be a leader in this community. What I told Brandon from day one, and you guys know my personality, it's just like, I don't see why we can't be number one in the country. It comes to certain things about education. We have the resources, we have the intelligence. And now we give our kids the tools, the technology. We do it the smart way to create that excitement, curiosity. There's no reason why. We, but, but for me, it's 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 actually for the boys. It's creating the critical mass for the girls to get the boys more interested. Do you have any more comments? I second that. Boys also keep the name. It, it's so important. Okay, we're ready to move on. All right. Just want to say thank you very much for all of your good work on yes. this important project. Thanks for volunteering. What's that? Yes. Thanks yes. For volunteering. Oh, volunteering. And even though you come from far away, as Broadway says. <laughs> no, it, uh, is, like, it, it is very interesting. So we, we need more citizens pursuing careers in STEM. I mean, it's, a, it's actually a national crisis, right? Um, but I think it just is going to take, it's my opinion, personal opinion, it is going to take a little extra push if we really want to get to some sort of realistic gender equity. It's, it's going to take a little different approach to encourage girls to picture themselves there. Mm -hmm. um, none of the models that were picked, again, we, we, we went around and did a whole voting. No one picked anything that had to do with competing. No one picked anything that had to do with weapons. No one picked anything that had to do with winning. It was topics that resonated. One was cooking, one was, and, and these were not guided by me. So I think the trick is, do we need an extra boost to make sure that as we're increasing our STEM studies, we're getting some level or some improve, some noticeable improvement in gender equity. But we need it across the board. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, you know, you've heard a lot about Girls Who Code and and how fast, fantastic it's been um, as a pilot, and that we're going to continue it um, and give this opportunity to our girls. But Girls Who Code, like other things we have that Julie had mentioned, some different coding activities. We have STEM clubs in some of our buildings. They're, um, they're great for our kids, but we're not reaching all of our kids. Uh, and, and we have pockets of things happening. And as uh, a good friend of mine once said, you can't make a good pair of pants with just a few pockets. So um, we formed a STEM committee uh, last fall and that STEM committee's focus was really to look at um, how do we make sure all kids have access to STEM? Um, and when we think about our um, vision as a district about success for all students and we think about 
uh, one of the um, statistics that, that Raina quoted about the, I think it was 63% or so of the jobs that, that are going to be available do not currently exist. We need to be preparing our students for careers and choices that they have the skills necessary to make for whatever that might be when they leave. And that means giving them access to uh, STEM related fields so that they have that knowledge base to make some decisions and think about it um, as a, a possible career or as continuing to innovate and evolve as things change. So our STEM committee tonight is gonna, our members of our STEM committee are gonna talk a little bit about that work. And to add just a couple more statistics to the evening, um, you see here on the slide, we've got 26 million uh, STEM jobs, 20% uh, 20, 20 of US jobs. Um, we've heard about the decreasing number of women in computer science. And um, you see there, 63% of teens have never considered a career in STEM, um, which when you look at that increasing field, that's something that we need to really think about and the last statistic there really speaks to something I think uh, Raina also said about, you know, even earlier, that, um, and I think uh, that Lisa said this as well, how girls get socialized out of STEM-related fields, and, you know, 50% of girls have lost any interest in STEM by eighth grade. Um, and there are a lot of factors in that, social factors and things, but we want to make sure that we're providing girls with the tools and the access to be able to, to make decisions, as well as boys, too. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our STEM committee and, um, you know, when we think about why STEM in Council Rock and keeps coming back to that access piece starting in kindergarten, um, we, want, we want students to see the power and the relevance of, of STEM and STEM related skills and, and um, fields to their lives and whether they choose it or not, um, we want them to understand that. And I think the other piece to really understand about STEM and STEM related fields is it's so closely linked to 21st century skills. When we think about 21st century skills, we think of things like collaboration, the ability to problem solve, inquiry, um, you know, computer literacy. And, and those things are all cornerstones of STEM. So even if a student chooses not to go into a STEM related field when when they leave us as a, a high school senior, the skills that they'll learn will benefit them to learn that opportunity. So that's one of the things that we really want to focus on, building that skill base and, and really preparing our students for a world that's becoming increasingly uh, defined by the intersection of science, technology, engineering, and math, and the arts as well. And I will make a clarification here that You'll see STEM a lot, and in when we talk in our committee works, um, it is not excluding the arts. Um, when we, you know, you might see STEAM used, you might see STEM used. Currently, um, if there is funding, grants, and things linked to STEM opportunities, they typically are linked to STEM and not STEAM. So we've chosen as a committee right now to keep it saying STEM, even though we all know as a group we mean STEAM, just because of how it's how it's coined in, um, in the vernacular, in you know, grant funding and in, in society. So we want to kind of just keep that in mind that we're not excluding the arts by any means in this because they're very very integrated here. So I'm going to turn it over to I believe Andrea. I think you are. Are you next? Okay, so we'll go yes. to the next slide. So what is STEM? Uh, and the definition that we're using is based on that quantum science center uh, research that we use to help guide us. It's an integrated interdisciplinary student centered approach to learning that encourages curiosity, creativity. You see that artistic expression, collaboration, some of the soft skills that we were talking about before communication, problem solving, critical thinking, and design thinking. So, what we see is those science, technology, engineering, and math embedded in a broad, cross curricular the whole child kind of approach to uh, introducing them to some of those areas. Uh, again, we, when we met as a committee, there were teachers from every grade level imaginable. So it looks different. It looks different when you're talking to a high school teacher as opposed to an elementary teacher. It looks different when it's embedded in the curriculum as opposed to if you're trying to introduce it in an after school club. But nonetheless, um, I will say that by far, the people that were on the committee were there 
not because they had to be there. It, it's an active and passionate group of educators who realized the value and um, want to take advantage of the opportunity of striking while the iron is hot, especially with the younger children. My turn. Oh, okay. So, in addition, you know, the big thing that you come across with STEM all the time is how it's inquiry based, uh, it's guided inquiry. You might see that a lot. We do in the science labs. And it is always integrated with multi multidisciplinary learning, which includes history, uh, lots of times current events have to be brought in to increase interest with the students. Everything is project-based, so we work in terms of teams, which you see a lot within the corporate atmosphere. And uh, at the end of usually every type of STEM project that we do, we'll have an extension of some level of career awareness to bring the student out into the real world concepts and tie the science or, their, or math they're learning in the classroom to the actual outside world and, world and their application of it. And one of the things that's changing in, in the world which our students are now growing up in is the availability and the outreach for what would be considered technology companies to look for venues into schools. So we're blessed to be raising and educating these children at a time when um, if you look or if you see, you shall find. It will definitely it's out there right now because they are interested as well in raising up the next generation of, of employees and people that will keep this country specifically on the forefront of technology. Uh, so our STEM committee consists of 40 members. We had students as well. We had some high school and middle school students who actually took some time to come in after school and participate, and they were vocal. They had uh, feedback. They, they gave us their experience. Um, there was, um, I know there was a young lady, uh, uh, two high school girls, I believe, and, and, a, and a middle aged boy, which is just so much fun to see children that have the ability to articulate in front of adults. Uh, we had parents, community members, teachers, administrators, uh, curriculum coordinators. Those were the meetings that didn't end. We just mm -hmm. kept talking and talking. So <laughs> they were productive and they were fun. So what we focused on as a committee, we kind of looked at um, when we started meeting and thinking about what do we need to do as a district. Uh, you know, we always want to start where we are. Let's evaluate our current practice. And we had um, conducted a survey in the spring prior to the start of this last school year to get feedback from teachers like what, you know, what STEM related things are you doing in your classrooms with your students to just kind of get a sense of what's going on. So we had folks that explored uh, that survey data. We also had folks looking at um, research and ideas, like just really trolling the internet and things to find out, like what's going on out there? Let's look at other school districts. Let's look at uh, you know industry and what can we learn about what's happening in other places to, to gather data and really think about what's going on. And, then we also, our meetings included action planning at the end of the year. So we really evaluated our practice. And one of the main things that we used in evaluating our practice was uh, through the Carnegie Science Center and their pathways tool that um, Julie and, and Tim can talk a little bit about as well. So we, um, as a committee of 40, we divided up into some smaller working groups to be able to, to really dig into the work um, and do what we needed to do and that led us to our action planning that you're going to hear about tonight um, from the committee members. So we used um, the, the Carnegie has a, a STEM tool that we used and Lindsay Sides from the Bucks County Intermediate Unit kind of facilitated the, um, the discussion with, with our subcommittee. Um, right here actually in this room, I can kind of picture some of the lively debates that we had um, going on that really um, asked us to really think about what are our practices in Council Rock and really decide are we in, in each area that we evaluated, are we giving access to all students? Can we say that all students are getting access to, to these skills? Um, and kind of what we've discovered along the way was we have lots of pockets of really great stuff. 
Um, but like Dr. Elliot said, it doesn't really make for a good pair of pants. <laughs> I like that quote. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> so, um, so the next slide, these were the components that we went through. And it took us probably um, about two, I think it was two, maybe two and a half meetings to go through all of these components and evaluate where we let where where we were as a district on teacher qualifications and development, um, where our curriculum is and where are the STEM opportunities in our curriculum that all students are exposed to. Um, particularly at the secondary level, we found that um, specifically in the high schools, um, you know, students we, we could say that we offered some of these courses, but we not all students were exposed to some of these topics given the course choices that they choose along the way. So we talked about how a little bit earlier in our curriculum, we need to be making sure that we're exposing kids to STEM careers, ideas, curriculum, so that they can decide what path they want to choose as they, they progress through. Um, we looked at, um, talked about our instructional practices. Um, the STEM definition that we're using is grounded in inquiry. And we really looked at, you know, are we using inquiry, uh, teaching practices, project-based learning, to, um, to help our students interact with STEM and different STEM standards. Um, we looked at our assessments and we looked at family engagement. You know, what kinds of things do we have that involve the community that help the community become part of STEM education? And um, then also our real world connections. Where are the connections that we're providing for students outside of just looking at the classroom and the content itself, but where, where are we showing those um, real world connections? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, part of me. <laughs> so from that, so from that, um, we came up with two STEM priorities. Um, after we whittled that down, um, we probably spent another um, another meeting with Lindsay Sides, um, kind of facilitating the discussion and help us honing in on what what exactly our priorities are. What, what is it that we want to focus on first? Because I don't think we'll ever be done with looking at our STEM education, but where do we want to go first? And we decided that we wanted to focus on collaborative planning of STEM curriculum, which to me kind of ties into STEM teacher leadership. Um, making sure that we have um, teachers working together to plan curriculum because we want to affect change. We can't just have isolated um, teachers working on curriculum. Uh, we need to, to have a, a community of teachers working together and then build the um, capacity of STEM leader, teacher leaders that can help bring the, um, the lessons, the content knowledge, the pedagogy, pedagogy necessary to make this successful to, um, to all teachers in Council Rock. Um, so those are the two, the two things that we focused on um, moving forward and it helped guide the rest of the work that we did in the committee. So the committee really took, you know, the work of the the group that did use the pathways tool, and these two particular priorities are what really steered the action planning, uh, because you could, you know, there were lots of thoughts and conversations about what to do, but we had to ground ourselves and center our focus in a starting point of we need to take that first step and go somewhere, knowing that this is going to be, you know, a process that's going to take some time. So. When we started the action planning, um, as a committee, we decided that it was important for that action planning to be level specific, uh, as Andrea kind of alluded to earlier, of the differences in, in how STEM um, is manifested in, in different levels because of what um, opportunities students have or how courses are structured and things work in, in um, different levels. Uh, we also, as a committee, uh, wanted to be extremely cognizant of current district initiatives uh, you know, having so many teachers on the committee being very aware of wanting to make sure we're not putting too much on teachers' plates uh, and really thinking about that. And we also decided as a committee that the bulk of the work that we'll do next year will be very level specific, but we will have some check-in check -in times as a committee, K-12, so we can continue to look vertically how are things going together, does it make sense? Um, and we this year participated in uh, the Bucks Intermediate Unit STEAM Leadership Council, and we'll continue that again next year. We have uh, representatives that attend those meetings and network with other districts and, and um, experts from outside of school districts to really continue to build our knowledge. Uh, so this graphic, as it, we tried to kind of figure out, well, how do we make this look? Like, so that there's a picture of what we're trying to do. 
when we think about success in STEM for all students, and and it's it's thinking about as a funnel these three levels kind of working together to get to that point. So starting at the elementary level with making sure access for all kids, um, you know, and integrating things in the curriculum, and then at the middle level really starting to look at more cross more cross curricular because of how the structure of the middle level classes work, and then at the high school level where students start to do a little bit more specialization in areas, how do we connect connected STEM at the high school so courses are connected with each other and students see some of those connection pieces. So um, we're going to have uh, committee members from each of the levels are going to talk about the, the action plan uh, for each of the three levels and we, we start with Andrea and the elementary. Sure, so the STEM action planning for the elementary school. Again, you see that focus is access to STEM for all students. Again, I'll repeat what I said before, it's critical to strike while the iron is hot, not to wait till students are in fourth and fifth grade to introduce the concept of STEM when they are probably receiving it in some way, shape, or form in another curricular area, but instead to give them opportunities that are fun and engaging and allow them to take those baby steps into what they may view as students, as young students, while really doing something really cool. Um, I brought along with me, this is an engineering as elementary curriculum guide. Um, you can pass it around in third grade this year. This one is going green, engineering, recycled racers. And if you take a look through here real quick, you'll see that the, the entire curricular package is here, lesson by lesson. So what's really neat about this is that, and this kind of goes into the next bullet there about this power STEM teacher leadership. Some teachers, um, especially at the elementary level, because they might not have a degree that's focused in one content area, they see the acronym STEM and they kind of think, I can't do that. But what this does, this program, um, because it's really broad based, and you have a huge selection of things that are specifically designed in elementary students um, activities, materials, uh, principles, resources. This year they're gonna be doing bridges, I believe, uh, building bridges in third grade. This program in and of itself, this is for grades three to five, I'll be using this in a fifth grade classroom because we're doing bio, um, bio boards or something. I don't remember exactly where we're gonna tie it in. But, so this is a good example of what it looks like when you're empowering teachers to not be afraid because here is the curriculum right here, pretty much in line of it. Um, and then also re identify and recruit potential STEM leaders to grow and learn, share their knowledge. That could be within a school, within a grade level, within other elementary schools as well. We want to see what's out there and be able to share it and create a network so that we can tap into each other and, and share our materials with each other. Planning that STEM curriculum, this is a really good start to that because this gives us a framework to see what works, to see what kids like, to see how we can tweak it to meet council laws needs. And to infuse them into those grade levels through integration, which is, um, it, again, it, it sounds like it's great right on a bullet point, but I think with the passion and the desire that the teachers have, something that's really realistic and very doable this year. Um, and we are going to come back in that community work during the first half of the school year and see what we can do to at least set a framework or build a skeleton of network so that we can communicate amongst the elementary schools. And the uh, engineering is elementary kit that Andrea mentioned is one of the one of the textbooks that was approved in in May uh, by the board uh, for our students for next year. So that's one of the things that we are moving forward for third grade that we will have. And I can tell you also, um, all third grade teachers will have a full day of training in that curriculum on one of our August in service days. All right, middle school, Mr. Teddy. I had, I had the absolute pleasure of working with Carnegie Tool with Dr. Eastman and many other people. And actually, another participant in that was Daniel Jordan, who was another administrator in the district. He attended some conferences as well. So you, you're going to hear recurrent themes here. But as we went and visited what other schools were doing in STEM, they, they, they looked similar to what we have right now, which are these really awesome programs that are going on. Where the success was met was when you had central administration in coordination with administration empowering the teachers who had expertise behind it. So when we talk about that STEM leadership, it's really about coordinating all of these awesome efforts so that we can have a complete product. And, and I want to be clear about that because 
the cross-curricular STEM committee at each middle school is really, we are in a unique position at the middle level that, are, that we already operate within teams. That the teachers interdisciplinary meet all the time. In addition to that, we also have, and I'm not going to get into detail, but drops where students can drop back to home. So we have these pockets of time that we can actually utilize and are already built within our school. Additionally to that, what we have is an arts rotation where the students are exposed to technology, to computers, to FCS, to career readiness. So we have all these major components which are defined as laid in, but from that planning of that STEM curriculum, it's a matter of coordinating that. Because what we want to do is do it well. We want to take our pockets and literally, since we're using that, build really good pants. And that's going to take time. So the time frame for the middle level is the second half of the year. You're going to see that different at the high school level, at the elementary level. And that is simply because of and because of where the middle level is at. We're still working through all construction projects through the consolidation of the middle schools as well as the implementation of the implementation of the ALC. So we want to make sure that we're putting the correct time in with our teachers on that startup, but we will build those communities so we can start building that capacity for that leadership and integrating that across how the curriculum goes with the middle level. And that's part of us, this committee really being cognizant of what's on teachers' plates. You know, the other piece that that we as a committee really talked about was, you know, next year, all of our teachers are going to be on a PLC team for the first time. And, and that's, a, that's a lot of a learning curve and, and, and change and adaptation for teachers. So even at the elementary's action planning, the bulk of that work is gonna be happening within a small group of people and not all teachers being expected to do something yet because we need to build some things first and figure out how we support before we dive in and, and give things to, to teachers. And we're really trying to be aware of that. I want to kind of take it back to, any, to the uh, general board meeting on Thursday. And we've heard Fred Bauer's name thrown around a lot because of the great work that he's done with NASA and what he's doing up at the high school. He gave credit to all of the teachers and all of the work that was done to prepare those students to be involved in those projects. And that's without any of this coordination from central administration and from that administrative level. So it's very exciting to be a part of a process where we can help build these capacities where you know, girls coding is going to, where does that fit into that? Because that, you know, that's one thing that we can be doing to be doing that. Because our hopes is to coordinate that not only from a curricular standpoint, but from where that leadership capacity is, perspective to the teachers in the world. Right, and high school, Christine. Where we end up. So you know, similar to middle and elementary schools, we do have a tremendous amount of STEM work that is occurring in all of our classes. And we do have, I think, a large number of AP math and science courses. The key part about it is what we saw is to capture kids at the ninth grade level and form teachers across two to three different curricular areas to come together and really pull those students through ninth grade all the way into tw 12th grade so that they continue along that path because you really start to see students specialize as they um, you know progress through their years in high school and without the knowledge of the integration of the math and sciences. And you can't have biology, for example, without chemistry. And you can't have chemistry, for example, without physics. And all of that is now computer-based because of computer science. Without that integration happening starting at ninth grade, um, it will limit our numbers of students continuing through up until 12th grade and graduating and going into you know, STEM majors in college or STEM-related type fields. So, you know, finding an overlap, I think, within two to three different curricular areas helps to, I guess, close that gap a little bit because it broadens the student knowledge. And I also think at the high school level, it also creates engagement and, you know, some definition of where a high school student's next steps 
might be in terms of the real world experiences. And that's, I think, what the major focus was of the high school level and the high school team. And we do have plenty going on. We just want to make sure that it's access to all and not limited to the students who just like science and math and, and the possibilities there. So how are we going to budget for this? Obviously, is a question that I'm sure is, is on folks' minds at this point. So we've already budgeted for this work for next year. Uh, it's, it's part of my budget. And um, a lot, the bulk of a lot of the work that will be happening will really be uh, releasing teachers from their classrooms. Uh, so paying for substitutes to come in so that the teachers can have the time they need to start digging into the work that they need to do, uh, you know, reaching out to those other STEM leaders or helping people see that they can be a STEM leader. Um, we also, as um, you know, as part of the middle school plan with some possible visits to some other schools. Uh, so that's also part of this. So when we look beyond next year, uh, what kind of expenses and, and uh, budget will be needed for that is, is going to partly depend on the work that the committee is doing to see kind of where we need to go. So it's a little bit hard at this point to say, oh, you know, we're going to need this or this because it depends right now. We've got to do some more of the work in order to know uh, what's next. Um, so when we look forward at it, kind of also thinking about some of the key things. So our focus with this committee's work has been really the emphasis on access for all students. Uh, really making sure that everyone has these experiences and is engaged so they have the knowledge and skills that they can make the decisions they need. And if they want to go into a STEM-related field, they have the experiences to know what that might be like and, and to pursue it. Um, being integrated into the curriculum is a really critical piece here, especially um, at the elementary level where our, we want our students to, to see how STEM and and STEM related skills cut across curricular areas and see how it, it connects to real world, as well as in the middle school and the high school. Um, you know, Carnegie's definition is very inquiry based, and so we want to continue with that focus. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the outset with those 21st century skills, the STEM and 21st century skills are so closely linked to each other, particularly when you look at the definition that we as a district are using through Carnegie. It, 20, 21st century skills are embedded throughout that definition and really continuing to look for opportunities for real world application for our students um, in as many ways as possible as we continue to do this work. So um, any questions uh, from it's the board first about uh, for members of the STEM committee? I do have a question. First of all, thank you for your presentation and all your good work. This is it's really exciting what you're doing. Um, and perhaps this question is premature. I don't know if you can address it. I'm just wondering, as this all develops, I see the integration part with curriculum, but I'm wondering if it will have any effect on courses that are offered or the way course recommendations are done, the way students select courses. Are we anticipating a change in the way courses are offered or the types of courses offered? I think that's a really good question that we probably right now don't have a good answer to. to ask, I think it's a but, bit premature. We need to see see where, where this goes. Um, you know, I know at the high school level, uh, with the action plan there, the, the team was really looking at, are there particular courses that we want to connect together for our freshmen in particular to really um, build that STEM knowledge and, and continue to, to foster that? And, and that there may be some linkage to that, but it, I think it is a little, a little too early to tell. Thank you. Yep. Anyone at the table with a question? It's an, interesting, it's an interesting question. And do our academic requirements for graduation, uh, they certainly accommodate this, no, no doubt, but do they accentuate it? Do they steer towards it? Are we putting, do we have any requirements that maybe we would discount to emphasize to bring in more credits in the STEM STEAM realm? Um, or is there any linkages that we want to subdivide? You know, that's great you take these many courses, but within those, I, I'm just asking, is it, do we want to, I don't want to be prescriptive and say, oh, you have to come out of the state. It's not everybody. Some people don't want to do that. Um, I think it's a fair question. I think it's a good question. Actually, that's it. With, um, 
thus bringing in Dr. Reddick. Remember, we uh, contracted for the services to look at our high school schedule that's been in place for four years and hasn't changed with six credits a year. So uh, I think part of that design might give us um, opportunities to then determine uh, if we have a different school day or a more flexible school day, how some of those questions get answered. I don't know the answer to it yet, but I think it's, it's what we're considering. Even to the point, and I know it sounds, I don't know about what it sounds, but let me say it and then we'll figure out what it sounds. Which is, I was, at one point, the state wanted to put certain seals on our diplomas that, you know, if you didn't have that seal, it was, and that was a real negative thing because we didn't have that seal. Your diploma was, as, as uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg would say, kind of a milk, milk, uh, skim milk diploma. You know, it was, it was not quite the full diploma. But I wonder, in the, in the, all, in the obverse of that, in the inverse of that, is there minimum requirements that we can include that then include an endorsement on our diploma relating to STEAM or STEM? It's kind of like what we do with links, you know, that you earn so many hours of links and you get a note on your uh, transcript. Well, I'm actually saying on the diploma that, that would actually yeah. be, you know, so I think, you know, either way, either on transcript or that it's, I don't want to say, you know, it's STEAM qualified or, you know, but, but that, that, because I think that when people are looking at that, it would be interesting as a recruiter, or as a recruiter, sorry, as a, uh, what do you call them, admissions officer. They see it and it says, hmm, they took the course through part. Interesting. I just, you know, some of the conversations going yeah. forward. Yeah. We do have a science National Honor Society, the Math National Honor Society. I agree. That definitely goes on their resumes and the transcripts. I think one of the things that we grab a little from that from the committee standpoint, because that, that to me is a very high school centric way of looking at I things. Agree. I understand that. So, STEAM in the, in the Carnegie definition is inquiry based and cross curriculum. So, how do we define that by a seal on it? It's really, and this is just where I think where the committee's kind of grappling with these issues, it's how are we empowering our English teachers and our social studies teachers to understand and work with their students in relationship to how that fits into STEAM-related activities. Hey folks, I'm looking at this going up to the back with the elementary school and high school in the 60s and 70s, because that was like, that was integrated in everything. It was, you know, it was in everything you did, it was some aspect of that. We have a national theme. When you want a big 25 inch TV set and three classrooms crowded together to watch it straight through. That's all I just, yeah, it's a. It's a um, um, thank you all. I just wanted to say I know it's been a long way in the making, but you have come a very long way in a very short period of time. I'm sure it doesn't feel that way, but this is a tremendous amount of um, collaborative work that it, it is at least very clear to me that it's a lot of you pulling together in a lot of different places, both community and our educators and our administration. It, it feels to me because I haven't done the work that it has happened really very quickly for us. So I wanted to just say thank you for all that. Just one, let me just check in with our board members who are with us remotely. Any questions or comments? I don't have a question. I'd just like to comment. This is Ed. That I think it's marvelous. There were 40 people who were willing to give of their time to serve on the committee. I think that's laudable. Thank you. Yeah, this is Joe. I just want to say I like what I heard tonight. And uh, I think we're going to see a lot of great results from the hard work the committee put. Yeah, and here's the this is Denise, I agree. This is, it feels like really significant progress has been made. It feels um, like for the first time in a long time where like the, the future and the planning and the commitment to advancing this uh, is stronger than I've ever seen. So great work to everybody. Thank you. Um, from the public comment. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I think you were talking about is critical is, is get started in a strategic planning process. So, you know, generally, if in the strategic plan, it's probably due at the end of 2019, right? So, is that right? November 2018? Uh, yeah, I think we start 
start. It's been delayed a year. Yeah. yeah. So if no one else in the country is doing this, again, going back to what I like to be number one, this is opportunity. You're going to start thinking about this. You get a reflective document that shows the strategic plan, that shows that how we're trying our best, even if it's a 10 year plan, to show that we're incorporating all the different areas, foundational skills into science technology, into social emotional learning, into the you know, collaboration. So, one of the key things in, in technology, what's great is that all these different operating models, you know, this is ever, they were already been created. So what we call with this, and I'm listening to everything, is called the solution development life cycle. Where what we're doing is like, when I'm creating a product, I'm not looking for programmers. I'm looking for the English major that's the creative person. I'm looking for the artist that can do the design. And what we do is like, we will set up an entire uh, process where we'll try to integrate the different skill sets that every single person has and try to make sure they understand the language of technology. They don't have to be the programmers. It could be the person who comes up with the funky idea, then there could be someone to translate that into some kind of different idea. There's a programmer, there's a tester. You can do that through this entire curriculum. You just have to have the right strategic planning process to incorporate it. And when it comes to like, you guys have already taken a great step at the PLCs, that's a professional language. Like right, so that itself, is, if you don't have that, you're not gonna be successful in, in doing this type of solution development life cycle because where to be successful, you need to have what's called like a, a, a strike street, like it's most like SAS reporting, right? Where we, when every time there's a, a, a you're stuck on something or anything like that, you don't have these group of teachers communicating with each other throughout the entire process and telling them, hey, here's an area that we're seeing a problem we need to focus on trying to fix, that process breaks down. So that's why the fact you're doing the PLCs is, is the right step to try to implement something like this. The question is, how do you incorporate the technology side, the social emotional side, and 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 PLCs all together in one in one operating model. It's, it's already been done. So it's like you can take it from industry, right? You can learn it from industry. That's what we do in industry all the time. And another thing is around you're we saying the teacher training. That is without that, none of this exists. So one thing to look into, and I'm, I'm happy to help out in any way, is the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. Um, they provide fellowships. Uh, and they had, uh, uh, I, can, I can introduce you to the director of, of uh, fellowship acquisitions. And his main focus is trying to develop these new models, figure out who out there that school district trusts that's going to stick with the school district, that they can, they can help create something like this that's new, that's innovative, and then teach them and give them a fellowship, pay them to learn this, then bring it down and spread it through the school districts. So I'm, you know, I'm happy to help out. And even if we don't get approved for that, to have them here to explain to you what are the different pieces that you need to do to create that, you know, create that type of fellowship. So that's great that you're doing it in the PLCs. And then with this strategic planning process, I know you're going to hear a lot. You're going to be really annoying about it, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. This is great, though, yeah. Other questions, comments? Me? Yeah, hi, Miss Carol. Hi. Um, over the last few years, one of my biggest criticisms of Council Rock was that all kids did not have the same kind of access to technology. It depended on where you sit and not and who you sit in front of, uh, or who sits and who stands in front of you. And um, I wanted the district to spend more money, time, and leadership to upgrade what exactly you're doing. And for that, I thank you. And I also say, don't be shy. If you need the money to make this go really big next year, you ask for what you need. Because when you go to other districts' websites, they have steam and STEM all over it. You know, Ms. Shamini, our next door neighbor, we were always rated, you know, better than them. But now, the top school districts that are you know, rated better than us, they are way far ahead in years of what they've been doing in technology, STEAM, and STEM. And I've gone out and I've seen wonderful things, wonderful pockets of things that are going on in kindergarten classes and first grade classes and middle school teachers. Um, so uh, to, to focus on this, to be access for all as your number one goal. I thank you very much. And uh, 
I very much appreciate this initiative in Capitol Rock, and I may uh, have to stop going to school board meetings and complaining about it <laughs> because I've been doing it for several years. That's spending too much money building empty seats and not on this kind of education. And it warms my heart. I thank you very deeply. And um, I'm always crying because <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've lobbied so hard. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Carroll. Are we hearing from anyone else? No, we're ready to move on. All right. Once again, thank you very, very much for all your work. All right. So moving on to our last topic. Um, I'm going to get up and ask everybody to take a 10 second stand and stretch Absolutely. because we warmed your heart, Nancy, with the air conditioner we're all Everything else is going to warm too well. Yeah. He's still on vacation. He was trying to have something, some peace of mind in okay. that aspect. So that's yeah. I, that's where it's coming from. Okay. Are we are we not muted yet? We are not muted. No, it's very very I was just waiting. That's fine. Joe, Denise, and Ed, please check your. Uh, let's not comment on it here. Just check your text messages about a request for a meeting around the executive topic. Text me individually, not all board members. Thank you for noticing the air. I have the same problem. You can always put them in. That's true. There was something. I missed something. Are we having technical issues? We're, on a we're waiting for uh, board members. Okay, ready to go? So, um, just as a, a quick reminder, uh, last year at budget time, I'm the district contracted with Handover Services, um, Handover Research, and um, through that, uh, this summer we sat with uh, representatives from Hanover as a uh, cabinet team and working with them uh, had to determine what research projects we wanted to place uh, some of our focus and energy with. So um, through that conversation, we felt that um, it would be important to do a climate survey of the district. Um, it was really coming partially on the heels of some of the conversations that took place over the course of last year, but also because we wanted to get a broader picture of um, the thinking of students, uh, staff, and parents about uh, the Council Rock School District. So uh, in September of this past fall, uh, the, the climate survey was open to um, students, parents, and staff. It uh, was open for approximately three weeks and closed in the middle of October, and we received the final report from Hanover uh, in December, right before the, uh, the winter break. So uh, certainly it may seem like it's been a long time since this has taken place and, and what's been happening, 
So after we returned, um, some of our conversations at the, uh, the district level uh, was to whether we should begin to try to digest this information now, but we also knew what was happening in front of us as a uh, administrative group was we were preparing for uh, a training with Living Strong. And it just seemed to make sense to us that for us to um, view the report with some perspective that we felt it was better for us to spend some time with Living Strong going through our administrative training that ended in May and that we would focus uh, a greater amount of energy on the findings moving forward. However, I also don't want to give the impression that we've done nothing with it because we certainly have, uh, have taken some time to try to digest it. So uh, I'm going to go through what, um, what broad overview of what the Hanover Research Report was. It was 30 pages in length, so you can imagine if you're trying to take 30 pages of data and graphs and charts, uh, it would take hours and hours. Uh, the full report, as you see it, will be posted, so everybody will get an opportunity to uh, view it, digest it, and uh, probably be helpful for future conversations, um, more so than it would be for tonight. So um, I want to talk to you about a few things. The, the climate survey itself was designed um, really for several audiences. Uh, first, it was uh, intended for all of our uh, parents, K-12. It was also designed for all of our uh, staff, K-12, but it, it was only designed in terms of the design of the questions for secondary students, uh, grades 7 and 12. So um, the respondents, you can see, give you a sense of how many uh, folks uh, responded to the survey. Uh, this also, by the way, will be on the website, this PowerPoint, so uh, you'll have access to it. You can see the number of students, again, grades 7 to 12, as well as the number of staff. So relatively decent uh, return. Um, you're never quite sure what you'll get when you put this information out there. Um, I'll go to the key finding sections because what uh, Hanover did when we try to do for you tonight is categorize a broad sense of what they reported back to us in these four areas. Clearly not everything fits nicely and neatly, but enough of it um, certainly can be categorized in those four and then I'll explain to you how we do it and then what we did with it. And then again, as I indicated, this uh, survey goes up. Do we know that it will be posted? Next week, probably, Next week, right? Probably. Okay. So, key findings. I'm going to start with, with a sense of the strengths. I narrowed it down to a single uh, PowerPoint just to give you uh, a picture of what uh, was viewed as some strengths of the district. Just in a general sense, I would say that we walked away feeling that we have a very strong foundation in which to work. We're very pleased with getting a sense of how people felt about the district doesn't mean that there weren't issues, concerns, or some areas that we're going to need to focus on. But uh, as you look through this summary of strengths, um, you'll get a sense of how people um, felt that the district um, was viewed. And this is across all three reporting groups, the staff, the parents, and students. However, I will also say to you, and you'll see it as we go through, and most especially you'll see it when you read through the full report, sometimes you'll see some conflicting data. So you'll see something that's reported as relatively positive, but you'll see an individual component that you'll look at and say, well, that doesn't seem to, to jive with a strength. So, um, and as you read the report, I think it'll make more sense to you because of the detail of some of the questions. So, uh, again, I only listed the three areas. I didn't list as the fourth where I, I had talked about um, because it didn't include any strengths or only two uh, statements made under it. But in these three areas, the academic, the social, and the school building, uh, environment, you'll see that um, people walk away with a pretty good sense that students and parents and staff um, like what's happening within Council Rock. Um, interestingly, um, most of what happened in the negative sense, as you'll see when it comes to the school and the building environment, was literally taken as environmental, like too hot, too cold in classrooms, those kinds of things. And, and that's fine because we come to learn from that too. Uh, and they, I don't know if that's a, an issue with the question or just how people were feeling at the time. Um, but as you walk through, you can see it in an academic sense, curricular in terms of expectations for student achievement, 
uh, feeling and sense of what the, uh, the academic uh, climate is like in the classroom, as well as the resources and materials that we have to support learning are all viewed as pretty strong. In the social environment, again, student-student relationships are you know, pretty caring and respectful. Adults care about students and respect students and that they feel like they're treated fairly. Uh, diversity is valued, and there's one of the ones that I'll, I'll suggest to you, you'll see some conflicting information as you read through um, some of the detailed questions. Uh, inclusive practices, and people don't feel that there, there's a lot of physical threat, uh, which is, is certainly a very positive thing, they feel safe at school. So what I'm going to do now is take some of the findings and break them down into three categories. So you'll see a repeat of some of these. So first, we talked about some of the things that we saw within the report that we felt we can and should address immediately. So you'll see those things that we are uh, started doing and will continue to do. Secondly, um, we built some of these into some of the initiatives that we already have going on. We heard uh, Sue talk about a lot on teachers' plates. So where we can, it would be wise for us to try to build some of the uh, responses to our work in this area. Um, to what we already have happened. Thirdly, as you heard uh, from um, you know, a gentleman in the audience speech well, I don't know, everybody knows who you are, so I don't want to, <laughs> I know who you were, <laughs> but um, talking about um, comprehensive planning. And, and really, comprehensive planning allows the district to develop a focus that is built into the systems of the school district. Um, so you'll see some things listed there. And there's some, um, uh, carryover between each of these. So some of them are um, initiatives that we started immediately as well as ongoing initiatives and will also look uh, as part of our comprehensive plan. So the first one um, that we started addressing immediately is in the academic environment. Um, this was mainly students feeling that there was a lack of connection of what's happening in the classroom to real life. Now, what I did, and I don't want to do this through each of these, but I can if there's a, a thought to do so. But I wanted to draw specifically to give you a sense of how this happens and why I view this way. So when I go to the actual um, question related to that, I want to give you a, a perspective of why that came out as it did. So when it speaks about the connection between um, real life in the classroom, the question was percent that agree strongly or um, just percent that agree connect class lessons to life outside the classroom. 71% of parents felt that was true. 98% of teachers felt that was true. And 63% of students felt that was true. So, the reason why I want to give you that perspective is we listed it as a need because our students, I mean, when you, when you look at it from a parent or a teacher perspective, it doesn't stand out as something that you may want to place a lot of focus on. But students felt that way. Again, not certainly not the majority of students, but enough that leads you to believe that you want to probably spend some time if that if the student perspective is that there's not a connection in real life within the academics. I'll go on and look at the next piece about academic support. And again, this was related to whether, and this was more of a focus of both students and parents, about whether students can have access to or realize they have access to some of the academic supports that we provide as a, as a school district. In both of these cases, um, these are already beginning conversations in our implementation of PLCs. So even had we not done the survey, these kinds of things are already a part of that. So that was good. That was something that we're saying, okay, maybe we want to make it a little bit more focused as we develop PLCs and implement PLCs, but it's not a new initiative that we need to begin because it was already part of that conversation. So I'll jump to the social environment. Student comfort in discussing social emotional concerns. So that jumped out at us because that, that would be a concern in a building if a student didn't feel there was a place to go. However, we weren't clear what was meant by that because there wasn't enough definition to it. So immediately, and this is really happening at the building level, we're trying to get an understanding or a clarification of what that means. So in other words, if you look at a secondary school, even an elementary school where there are counselors, 
Does that mean the student doesn't feel comfortable going to a counselor or doesn't feel comfortable going to their classroom teacher or doesn't feel there's a trusted adult that if they had an issue that they felt the need to go to regarding what's happening to them socially, um, we wanted to narrow that focus down and get a sense of it so that we can apply the right type of um, solution to it. So we don't know exactly what students meant by that. The next uh, intolerance concerns, um, and I'm going to tie that in with the bullying and harassment concerns. So really, prior to this beginning, we had already made a commitment and started planning for uh, training of trainers that was done by the Peace Center, and that training has occurred for all of our schools who have trained trainers in them, as well as a, an overall training that was done for all support staff. And then as I indicated, the follow-up to that was the administrative training that was done through Living Strong. Now, one of the things that we believe having um, had our own administrative training is trying to tie all of that together, trying to make some sense. Because at one point, um, I think our belief was we would probably move forward a little bit more quickly with the teacher training that was done through, that would be done through the trained teachers that was held through the Peace Center. However, we paused that for a little bit and said that seems to be out of sorts without our administrative staff having any training. They weren't a part of, and by design, they weren't a part of the training that was done through the Peace Center. So we wanted to catch up with our administrative team so that we could all be on the same page so that now at the building level, um, the trained teachers, as well as the administrators who have now been trained can collaborate and plan and coordinate and move forward collectively rather than having this this joint training going on. So um, those two got tied together and I think we're very pleased at least walking away from our administrative training. I would say across the board, I, I have not been a part of much in Council Rock where uh, a required training has been met more positively than it has been, and you see heads shaking over here as positively as it was through Living Strong. It was just an outstanding opportunity um, with some very good people that I think will, will service the district for years to come. So I'll jump to the school and building environment. Um, bathroom safety came up, and again, that was a concern to us, but um, without having the opportunity through the initial question to get a sense of that, as we look through some of the open-ended questions, what we did find was that it was really more focused at the secondary level and primarily to vaping. So students were feeling uncomfortable walking into a bathroom because they believed, I shouldn't say believe, that they were indicating to us that there was a lot of vaping going on. Vaping is very difficult to, it's not like, tobacco where you often get a, a strong sense of it happening. Um, somebody could vape in a bathroom and an adult could walk in and not even know that it had occurred. So um, that jumped out at us, most especially at the high schools, uh, somewhat middle schools. So as a, an example, we just increased our bathroom checks, just randomly putting in security staff, um, any other staff as they're walking through administrative staff just to stick their head in them into a bathroom and make sure nothing was going on. Um, we do need to do more. I think we need to do a lot more from an education standpoint. I think students don't quite understand, and I believe sometimes parents don't understand the negative health effects of it. Um, so hopefully, you know, we'll take some time and be able to do that a little bit better. Um, I'll, I'll also continue to try to make sure that if kids walk in bathrooms, they can walk in and feel comfortable using those. Building cleanliness, uh, as I indicated, was, uh, as you see, two out of the three uh, negative components that we addressed immediately were designed more around the physical environment rather than the safety environment. The building cleanliness was one. Um, for those who you know were paying attention or were listening as we developed a new Aramark contract, you'll see that we increased the level of expectation. So some of the uh, services that are provided have been um, brought to a level that we think will address these concerns. Again, you can imagine that most of this or the, the heavier component of this was done through staff or the ones that felt the buildings weren't as clean as they, they should be far more than students and so uh, much more so than uh, parents. Uh, building climate was really temperature focused and, um, and that's problematic for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is, and I don't mean this piece is necessarily problematic, 
but we do have a policy that defines energy guidelines within our classrooms, and there's a relatively narrow range for both uh, heating and cooling. So our rooms are designed to do that. We all have homes, we all have HVAC systems, and we probably all complain about them. You know, they're just difficult systems to manage, just to make right for everybody that's in a room. So not everybody is comfortable at every temperature. So that's just uh, part of the, the limitation we have to deal with. In addition, we have a number of buildings yet, most especially at the elementary school, that aren't climate controlled. So we hit a couple of those very warm days, and you probably saw that last week of school when we uh, tried to do a couple of things for the elementary schools that aren't air conditioned. There's just nothing we're going to be able to do to make that building comfortable for students or staff. Um, so that is really very high on the list. And if you read through the uh, survey, you'll see that uh, it was mentioned a lot and brought up probably the most often commented component in uh, the narrative that uh, we're allowed to respond to. So we want to initiative. So again, remember I said I kind of broke these down into these three categories. So some of these you'll see are going to be repetitive, but that's okay because, you know, something to address immediately and something to build into our initiative gives it a higher likelihood of success. So under the academic environment, um, this was new, access to technology. Um, again, some of these you kind of walk away feeling a little bit good about because even before this, we already had a technology plan. So we had a technology plan that added technology integration specialists into our elementary schools, knowing that we were growing those in the middle of the high schools. We already have a plan to almost go to two to one um, as we build uh, access to technology into our buildings. So that is underway and continue to serve as an initiative. Um, happened at the elementary school last year, moved to the middle school this year. The, the board um, kindly um, allowed us, we, we had planned for a technology integration specialist at the elementary school to be there for a single year. The board saw the importance of it and the need for it and that their direction asked us to keep that in the budget. So that will continue while we add the technology integration specialist to the middle school. And then the following year we'll add, uh, add to the high school. Student attitudes toward learning. Um, really, a lot of that was um, related to things like motivation, um, not necessarily trying. I mean, kids indicated that they try hard in, in the classroom, but they don't necessarily uh, feel motivated um, to, to do well and don't always see the connections. So, again, I, I believe that. You know, our plans for the incorporation of PLCs, what that will do to design and help teachers deliver instruction, as well as some of the intervention that will happen a little bit uh, further along in the future, will really give us a chance for students who are struggling with learning to um, have a, an opportunity to be remediated, but also give us a chance to extend learning for those that might pick things up more quickly and not feel as if they are being held back or necessarily bored in a classroom. In the social environments, um, again, I'm going to tie both of these together, the intolerance concerns and the bullying and harassment concerns. And again, if you, when you get a chance to do the entire report, you'll get a sense of who's reporting what. Because it's not across the board. You won't see a complete picture of uh, students that report that there may be some um, issues of intolerance or of bullying or harassment. However, there are certain subgroups that you see enough of a gap between what they report that would be a concern. There could be a particular population, there could be a particular uh, ethnicity, a particular religious group um, that may not feel quite as comfortable as the general population. So when you read it as a full response, it doesn't look poorly on the district. In fact, it looks pretty good, but then as you look at an individual subgroup, you say, well, we better do a little bit better job making sure that this group of students feels comfortable in our schools. I believe, again, the work that was done, the, the training that was done with the Peace Center, and the work that was done with Living Strong is really going to give us opportunity um, to not just take a shot at trying to do something right, but really to embed something into our practices that make this better for kids where they will be in a school and parents will recognize the difference over time. None of these things are quick fixes. I think some of them we, we try to, but over time, I'm getting the sense that our teachers and our staff will be more sensitive to and more responsive to 
some of these things that you'll see when you look at the, the individual report that relates to um, intolerance or harassment or bullying concerns. And in the school building environment, as I indicated about um, bathroom safety, um, through Dr. Lambert and our um, special services group, teachers get a chance to do a PLC that really is focuses on focused on the subject area. But what the um, student services group is going to work on, counselors and cares coordinators, etc., they're really going to put an initiative into place that focuses on vaping. So they're going to try to plan over the summer and build a program that will allow us to address what the educational piece that I spoke about, but also helping us to think about how we want to address um, a response for students that we may find uh, the So next, um, the third area that we talked about was comprehensive plan. So this, these are the long-term components that we build into what happens in the district. That first conversation begins this summer, but the actual plan, as Jigger had said, I can use my name since you introduce yourself again, happens in um, uh, the, the 19th school year. So these are things that we feel would be important. I don't want to say that these will be in the comprehensive plan. This would be our suggestion for the comprehensive plan committee. To consider comprehensive planning committee uh, usually includes students, uh, staff, administrators, board members, parents, other community members. So it's a broad representation of Council Rock. Um, in the academic environment, PLCs um, our continuation or expansion of it. Um, I think that has already been committed to. I don't see that whether that's part of the comprehensive plan or not. That is happening. You know, so we are far down that path, and that will continue, and that's a good thing. Student mental health support. Uh, I think that we are in a, in a different era now where maybe some of our approaches to student mental health um, are a continuation of things that we've done in the past and we're already looking at ways in which we can address that better and maybe differently. You know, issues that, that students deal with are not the issues of even 10 years ago. I mean, things are changing, the world is changing. Um, and Sometimes um, school communities and schools are like the cause of that. And we're going to need to find different ways to uh, provide support services for our students. That goes back to that, that um, picture of our students comfortable talking to a member of the staff. You, know, you never want a student to feel like over an entire seven hour day, they walk into school and they can't go to someone. Um, we need to make that comfort level available to them. Social environment, and I kind of pull all of that together because, again, I think that they all relate to some of the training that we have in front of us. Um, we have a lot of people jumping at the bit to get started at it at the building level. Again, a good thing. We're trying to um, coordinate it and make sure it's uh, the right approach so that it's not haphazard and it's not independent of a district wide look. And not every building has necessarily the same um, areas of focus. So part of it is we want our, our, our building administrators to digest some of this too, as some of these things are really much more pertinent at maybe a high school level or at a particular high school than it is at a particular elementary school. And then uh, the, the one that wasn't in any of the others is because there were really only two specific areas that came up under the stakeholder inclusiveness that were um, more critical rather than, you know, there were no necessarily positive responses to this. Uh, the one parent engagement was parents not feeling that they were either included or valued in the decision making, whether that be at the building level or at the district level. So um, that was a relatively high number of percentage of parents that indicated that. And the last one uh, was really related to communication. Communication is always a very interesting thing because you sometimes walk away feeling no matter how much you communicate, it's never enough. And I think really. The issue is probably how effective is the communication, not more, more effective communication. So I think we're going to have to make that determination. You know, and I think in teachers' minds and administrators' minds, when we talk about communication regarding academic progress, when we incorporated Home Access Center, people thought, like, there's a, there's a daily update on how your child is doing academically. Yet, parents don't believe that there's enough communication about that. So we're going to have to dig a little deeper and say, what, what does that mean? You know, what is a parent indicating when they bring that up? But you also have some thought here in terms of the parents who responded have a higher connectivity to, I mean, how many parents are there? 
there are to be 11,500 students. Assume that a few of those are from, half of them are from multi-children families. It doesn't sound right, but that's right now. So that's five, that's 10,000 parents. You had 3,500 respondents. So I just, I, I wonder if, and I'm not discounting, I just need to look at it through the right lens. Those parents who are engaged already responded higher propensity to respond. And then they would be looking for more. That the 7,500 who didn't respond, they may not feel the same. They may not feel the same because they already chose not to respond to self selected And I'll give you again a perspective. So when I go to the chart that speaks to this issue of this state water inclusiveness, um, so these are the, the three lows that came through staff members. Um, and the question was sent that agree or strongly agree, this is parents only, that staff members are transparent with parents about school decision making. 55% either agree or strongly agree. Parents' inputs or uh, ideas and input are valued. 58% agree or strongly agree. So, you know, from a perspective standpoint, I don't want to give you a sense that 10% of the parents, you know, feel that we're not providing information. The majority of parents feel that we're doing those, but if there's such a, a gap in some of these things that you're saying, okay, so even if 60% feel that we are, if 40% aren't, that's a pretty big part of our population that feels disconnected for some reason and we should address it. If you had 80% feeling that, you know, they agreed or strongly agreed and you're saying 20%, I'm not sure that it rises to that same level, but 40% is, you know, big enough that I think it, it draws our attention mm -hmm. to uh, so some additional actions and things that we're doing with this now that we feel better prepared to look at it, maybe with a different lens than we would have in the summer. One thing is that um, as a district, we're reviewing data because it's important for us to get a sense of all of our buildings and how all of that comes together to form an opinion of, of Council Rock in general. Our principals are reviewing the data and kind of looking at what things may be more pertinent to them based on um, the things that they hear, the conversations they have with their students, the conversations they have with their parents. And then again, the, the, one of the strongest ones is the, the work we just concluded with Living Strong and trying to, you know, gain an understanding of the kinds of things that we can and should be doing that are age appropriate um, for implementation and building into the work that we do every day. So that's kind of like a broad picture of what's happening um, at the district level. So I'll open it up. I know that it was relatively brief. What we didn't want to do was end the school year and not have this come out. Have people wondering, is there something that we're trying not to release? We, we didn't want that to be um, the perspective of people. We know that a lot of people knew what's happening. I'm probably wondering where it was. But we also wanted to give you an explanation of why we waited because we were trying to delay. So our perspective um, and our work moving with uh, the information that was provided um, could be better understood and, and come to it with a different lens and a different approach. Um, and then I think that when the full survey will go up, all 30 pages will go up, um, people will have a chance to read it themselves, digest it, you know, maybe make uh, some different interpretations. Most of the interpretations I gave you were the ones provided by Hanover, not specific to our interpretation. I think we see some things that we would have maybe thought about differently, but they did the research and they put together um, their overview of, of the response, and that's what I delivered to you tonight. Okay. Thank you. Questions? No, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see that. The diving of the data is interesting. Some of your observations, you know, the transparency observation, the parent engagement observation. I'll be interested to see how that stratifies. I think you've pointed out a couple times tonight in earlier conversations. Elementary, middle, and high school are different. And I think that that, that stratification will be interesting to see. Uh, because I don't think it's the same solution. I don't think it's the same mm -hmm. challenge. I don't think it's the same solution in all three places. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see that on the further past. But I appreciate rather holding to do all the final, you know, if you wait until everything's final, it will never get done. So I appreciate it. The distribution center. Thank you. Any other board comments, Mr. Hidalgo, Mr. Tate, Ms. Brooks? Yeah, I um, I just uh, have a couple of questions and comments. 
Uh, one is I, I would like to resist uh, any characterization of the respondents. I don't think it's a, we can make assumptions about who's participating and your more engaged, you know, more engaged people will participate because the, the numbers of people that responded, I don't know what the full sample size is of how many parents we have, but those numbers look pretty high, which would indicate that this is really reliable and statistically significant data. And, you know, you can only draw conclusions on what the data says, not what you, your personal uh, interpretations of outside things. So I just want to caution that. Um, I think it's really great to have data that will direct action items. And so, you know, as an example, I have heard from the community in a lot of different places about the extensiveness of the vaping and the, the bathrooms and things. And, you know, initially I was like, well, is this a really big problem? Is it this just is this just something that you know a couple of parents say but when you have it as a data point along with so many of these other things um it helps you really work towards something um so that's great the other thing is is that we talked about uh you know i heard a comment like the majority of of parents or the majority of respondents are happy and you know for me on some of these things i'm not looking for tipping the scale over 50 percent these are the kinds of items that I want 100%. I want 100% of our students to feel safe going to the bathroom. I want 100% of our parents uh, feeling like their feedback and contributions are, are being listened to. So, you know, th this is just a starting point and creates a baseline. So it, it leads to a question, um, is there uh, an idea that we will use Qualtrics or, uh, you know, to follow up to see how we're trending over time? Yeah, I think that's a, um, actually we're this summer going to uh, get our work started with Qualtrics, and I think uh, part of what we need to do is help to make those determinations because these, I, I do believe that these single shot surveys um, are helpful, but they certainly don't give us a picture of what's changing over time, and I think that's going to be an important part of what we do moving forward. Yeah, I would also caution going forward a lot. The feedback that I recall, a lot of people did not understand what the language climate survey meant. A lot of people did not understand that this was like a school culture, the client, like they thought it was like air conditioning, you know, or global warming or something. You know, there were a lot of people who, after the fact, who I would have thought would surely answer the survey reported back to me like, oh, I didn't even know what that was. So we should, you know, really just be careful about language as we do this to follow up because we would like to encourage the highest possible participation. And the other thing is, is just, you know, from my background, in going forward, you know, we can approach this, you know, more like a, a, a pulse survey in a moment and, you know, to pick out from the Hanover research you know, the very key elements or the things that we feel we've put the most efforts towards in, in action items. And so that you know, it doesn't have to be as lengthy a survey, like you could really get at the heart of evaluating your trends and understanding if the strategy that you're using to work towards some of the things that this survey reveals is helpful or not helpful. Um, the other thing is, is that I would love to see um, and, and Jerry spoke to this about, you know, some greater segmentation to understand where we are not aligned. Is there a big difference between what staff thinks versus parents and our elementary parents, you know, vastly different than secondary parents? And, you know, is there gender differences for students? Is it there are differences in buildings and things like that? So Qualtrics would be able to easily do that and, and use those filters. And I, I don't know how much Hanover did so, but really, I, I love that we have this research and and these findings. It's really really helpful. There's a term being used, and I don't know if it was really clear to everybody. Hanover Research was the firm that we have used to collect this data and did the analysis. We're now going with another company. We're changing companies. Not it, it's a financial experience, and also, you know, we have some reliance and confidence in the other and the newer product as well. That's Qualtrics. So we're going to change the instrument provider. It'll still be, these are not validated instruments. These are survey questions, right? There's no, these are not purchase scales. These are not somebody's intellectual property that we're using to do these scales. So there'll be a little difference potentially, 
by changing providers. But that's why when Ms. Brooks talks about that we're going to Qualtrics, it's a different set of tools to gather data and then analyze it. Yeah, and primarily, um, Andover does their own research with Qualtrics. It's a tool that we will use to build and, and collect the, the data. Uh, it's not, not for comment, it's just for clarification, because unless you follow these meetings, meeting by meeting, you may not know the difference. Mr. Hidalgo or Mr. Tate, anything to add? Just Mr. Desco, thanks for this, and I look forward to taking a closer look. Thank you. Sorry, I'll say the same thing. Uh, Barry, great job, great presentation, and looking forward to... Uh, to using this type of technology and information to better serve our community. Thank you both. Any comments from the public? Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Beth Camp. I have two kids in the district, one middle, one in high school. Um, here we have one of my colleagues from the first parent, first year group. Um, two things I want to talk, and I'm also a data person, so I agree with Denise. One of the things that really popped up to me personally, and we discussed it, is that terminology of climate survey. People thought it was about air conditioning. <laughs> So I question whether you see that section building environment as being valid as what you were trying to get out of it because people didn't understand the question at all. Mm -hmm. So when they hear building environment and climate survey, they are literally talking about the physical building. I mean, where we I think we put too much um, I don't know weight into thinking people are going to understand sort of the, the language that administrators and, and school people. Use. So, A, I wonder if you got out of it what you intended to, or are we missing something really big there that we never got? Um, the second comment that I want to make, um, and it's related to data again. So, in the social aspect, we had bullying and we had inclusiveness and very careful wording that I saw there, but it, you, the comment was to keep wrapping them together. So, I think. Well, the actual physical, um, I guess, endpoint of a lot of the inclusive and diversity issues is a bullying concept. I think that we need to be careful to separate the data that says this is bullying, which might be related to diversity issues or inclusiveness, but this is still a very separate issue between the two. So I just want to make sure we're not putting everything into a basket because that's what we feel it is when the data is actually saying something that it's not. That's a good point. So I'll just... And, oh, were there sub-questions, Mr. Yeah, Desco, so that I, I think that out? Um, the word climate um, could be misunderstood and misrepresented, but some of the specific questions, and you'll get a chance to see them, I think gave us an opportunity to get the data that we wanted because they, they speak specifically. And the reason why I tie all them together and the bullying and harassment was because that was a lot of the focus of our training. I, I agree with you that you can't just clump those together because they, they bring about both different issues as well as different responses. However, the training um, was across all three of those areas, and I think that's what I was trying to connect together for what happened with the Peace Center as well as what happened with our training for Being Strong. And so I just think the words matter and how we present mm -hmm. it is very important too, so that. Some people might not, I, I'll be, uh, I was kind of like bunching this all together, but hearing you say that you see that it's two different issues means something, and I think we hear it that way. So I think when you communicate that to a broader audience, it's important that you show that you understand that. So that's all. Um, uh, first, I want to thank you for doing this survey. It is extremely important to have data, to have data uh, determine our practices. What are we going to do? How are we going to change? And even though we may use another survey in the future, there's some items that we kept that we think are so relevant and we still want to know, you know how we're doing in terms of climate and really harassment. I am curious though um, to hear how you know that one of the problems that we found in the survey that kids reported harassment and bullying. What's the percentage? How many kids are we talking about? Um, and also, you said that some groups are more targeted than others. This specifies what are those groups are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, uh, race related? Um, that, I'm curious because I uh, you know religion, because those are the changes we have to start 
implementing as soon as possible the same things going through our schools, we have our class. Because we don't feel more queer diversity. Or it's not. Or it's not. Yeah, it's not. It's a database. Right. And now, this is important to have average data. And now, are the schools getting also segregated data? You know, just looking at the one school's are they doing their building? Yeah, they will, they will do that too, yes. yes. So I do want to say to you that the, the one question that was that broke down uh, specificity to student responses was the question was how frequently do you experience some form of harassment or bullying at school based on your physical appearance, political beliefs, race, ethnicity, or skin color, religion, sex, disabilities, gender identity or expression, or sexual orientation. So you get a chance to see how um, students and staff members responded to each of those. So that, that's kind of the breakdown you got on that particular question. So you, and you'll see that in the, in the survey. Now, what would be interested also to find out is like, who was more likely to say that it's hard? Trouble saying or the boys? Yeah, and that, right. Did they provide that information? No, that detail did not come out because I'm not sure. I mean, ultimately, not everybody had to select who they were as a respondent. So. Oh. Some that was optional. And I have to say that I'm very pleased with what I've heard many schools are doing, especially my kids' school. I have to say I feel very proud of um, Mr. Keene and the teachers who attended the training because uh, I see already in a year big changes. Uh, teachers really embracing diversity conversations with the kids in this office queue. Uh, I'm just glad. Readers and, and puppet show with the kids, and she was able to show uh, this presentation to younger kids, and they discuss diversity and stereotypes and, and skin color. But really, really embracing these topics, they took opportunity to do the board. Uh, so I'm, I'm really impressed with what has happened in a year, and I do hope this is happening not only at my kids' school, but at every single school. So I really uh, want to thank you for what you've been doing, and I, and I have to say, you know, I've, I've seen positive changes already, and I'm hoping that yeah, they yeah. keep feeling more comfortable in talking about diversity, really teaching the kids to respect one another, regardless of it. For sure. Yes. Um, one thing that, uh, as I was looking through the entire presentation, that struck me is this technology, that technology is having on our kids, I mean cell phones. Um, one of the this is just it's clear as day that it affects us at home, it affects us yeah, every part of our life. And if uh, if anything that we try to teach kids about baking and this and that, we've got to first probably focus on just like we did in driving and you know, like when kids were dying from car crashes, we started driving at and kids were getting pregnant and getting STDs, we did sex ed. This is our next mental crisis issue right now. This is going to be about technology because the way the kids bully each other, the way they treat each other, the way they talk to each other, the way they can communicate in the same room is through this stupid piece of machine, right? So if our focus is not going to be on, you know, and I, I think we start at like fifth grade, fourth, fifth grade, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, grade, and just start focusing on like this is a piece of machine that until you have that conversation face to face, this is nothing. This is just this is just for play. And it's like kids cannot dissociate from this thing that this person said to what the reality is that physical space, the threat that really is right in front of you. And if we don't, as a community and as a school district, try to figure out how to make that connection with the kids and teach them. I'm sorry, none of this is going to matter. I'm sorry, none of this is going to matter. <laughs> sorry, none of this is going to matter. It's going to happen so fast, it's not going to matter. So one of the critical things that I'm, I'm you know, when we talk about strategic planning and talk to you, is about not only teaching STEM and stuff like that, but why is that important to learn so kids know the connection between technology and what's you know they're being exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one of the key things with vaping or bullying or anything like that is, is a lot of our children are not taught decision making. There's there's clearly social emotional learning that you can tie into decision making. And I think a strong part of we're trying to use PLCs, teach STEM, teach anything right now, has to incorporate social emotional learning, decision making into that, that curriculum. If you do that, the hope is that at least to get a touch of it, that they'll start 
say, okay, remember how decision making you don't make because of this, this, and this, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just one of those things that instead of like looking at each single problem, go to like the root, figure out the right age. I don't know, I'm not a teacher, I don't know. I'm assuming it's going to be sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and kids go through puberty. That's going to matter the cost. Right. It seems like it's happening earlier and earlier. Yeah, I'm more than sure that it's, you know, six, seven, and eight now seems. I mean, I think years ago, that's when you started seeing some yeah, scary issues. Yeah, much earlier. Scary. Very scary. Do you have one more question, actually? I'm sorry I missed the presentation, Mr. Kwan. Uh, I So recess is not being taken away. No. Um, that is not the, the current number of minutes of recess that kids have now at the elementary level they will have next year um, in, in the different grades. So it's different from first, second, and third than it is four, five, six, the number of minutes. But that's staying the same. As far as morning meeting, the um, morning meeting is being reduced by five minutes. So not a significant reduction in minutes at all. Uh, and I think that the other piece to consider with when you think about social and emotional learning is that the work that teachers are doing to build that social and emotional learning, it's not just happening during morning meeting. Morning meeting is where there are key conversations and some modeling and lessons that happen, but then that gets reinforced throughout the day. For students so it's not a segmented part of the day that they never talk about again it's something that continually comes up as, as situations arise you know where oh well what did we learn in morning meeting this morning or the other day that can help us in this situation so it's it's something that is it's part of being integrated in within the curriculum I was going to say regarding the, the vaping issue it is so. I have a son in high school, and the things that he tells me that he sees throughout the day are absolutely appalling. I mean, they're, they're definitely their kids are making in the classrooms, on the buses, in the bathrooms. There's napkins in the trash cans at in the lunchroom. Um, it's the jewels of blue. They're not vaping, just you know, just the flavor of vaping. You know, the napkins for the. And the um, nicotine and the control is pack of cigarettes, and they don't understand. They truly don't. And if you give them as much information as possible, but I don't think as adults, parents understand. And I and it's and they all feel it's not their child. It's a lot of them. And apparently, the the resource officers who go around, they're they're really working hard to you know nab this kid. But three day suspension, which is the uh, you know the automatic thing you get, isn't doing it. They're they're buying it on school property, they're selling it. Um, the stories are endless and they're daily. So, yeah, yes, I've made the social media that's on, on the radar. The police are involved with, you know, having the course of the classes and my daughter went to one of the high school about you know, social media and all that. But, I mean, she even told me that when Rich Grove came to um, tour columns, that would be one of the things they think on the tour. So, uh, where is the breakdown? Why aren't the kids pinpointed and see? And yeah, and they start to smell it. A lot of it really isn't. But they do it in like, the kids, the kids know what they're doing. You see a kid doing this, they're big. <laughs> and the devices now are so small. They are this big. Yes, they are this like big. Really but they all, they don't all just look like this. Some that look like a contact lens that I feel that way, and that's the blue stick. Mm -hmm. Like you really, as a parent, have to. Do your research because you're gonna get something off the car or you know your kid was driving and say, What is this? They'll say, Oh, that's part of a, a, a magic marker. But it's not. It, it, it is unbelievable. And the lack of knowledge that the teachers, administrators, counselors, and parents have about it is, is unbelievable because these kids know everything. And and it's, it's 
and the kids were doing it across this every second. But you and we instructs us all the kids. We we don't contrary to the country. It absolutely we don't possible. sell them in the schools. No, no, you're I mean, they're, 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 they're they're school. we're not selling them. We are selling them in the school. And the irritability in the students who are you know who are willing to I mean you can pinpoint kids who haven't had their school in a while because they have the cigarettes. And then they're so irritable. Well, to your point about uh, increased education around this topic, I wonder if we could facilitate with the Council Rock Coalition for Healthy Youth. I know they offer um, parent workshops. They yeah, offer. Parents are that's, that's and, and, yeah. So, like, I, I take it upon myself to read articles article and explore every article, you know, to my kid. It may or may not stop them from doing it, but I also want to know that the kids doing it in the classroom isn't allowed. The kid doing it on the bus isn't allowed. Um, and that we're going to use fun as additives in the trash can. Why is pot getting into the school? Why, why, is it, why are they walking in and out with, you know, adaptants? Why is it in every bathroom? Just so we're clear, because everybody's not. Zap is what we used to call dip. No, no. It's an oil that has a THC in it. And it is odorless. And um, it is basically in the base. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I think that is the the purpose of the the, uh, people services. PLC, so to speak, it's not technically a PLC, but their collaboration next year is really to help us try to get a hold of this because it is a concern. We don't see it in the elementary schools, we are seeing it in the middle schools exactly. and significantly in high schools. And, and, and to um, Mr. Graf's point, yes, it starts at home, but we can't be permissive and walk the other way in the school of happy people getting with the Sierra Tom and Bossy and make it so of also a lot of previous suspension. You know, well, again, I want to make sure that that message doesn't get out incorrectly. It, it is um, much more than a three-day suspension if it is a, a substance, an illegal substance. Right, no, no, just yeah, okay, yeah, just 40, 40, 45 right. days. 45 days. Right, right. right. I, I, I just want to make sure that it's all that good. But I'm just talking about regular vaping right. and the public vaping. It's done like a tobacco. It's a tobacco. 45 days. It's not three days. 45, 45 if it's an illegal. Substance like the dabbing that would have right. a THC, but if it's, if it's more like a nicotine product, it's treated like a tobacco violation. And the $50 fine, so it's a three day suspension of the $50 fine for the first offense. Right. Is it referred to the judge? Never referred to the first offense because they would prefer that. That's what the $50 fine is. Well, that's but it's our option. We can still refer it to the judge. Well, we do that. We're getting mixed reviews about how that's handled legally differently than, a, than tobacco products. So we're trying to get to the bottom of that. So. Other comments? Yeah. These are the guns. Yeah, so going back to um, uh, the uh, climate survey, um, I actually had a, a, a couple questions and a concern. Um, so I know you're improving you know, the intolerance and harassment, um, and, and I know you didn't do it intentionally, but you know, the comment that you made, I think, is kind of something that's kind of generally stated across the board, um, and it kind of it causes concern because I think that's kind of what some of the heart of our problems are. Um, so you said, you know, the, the things that you're seeing, you know, the harassment bullying, it's not across the board, which of course it's not going to be across the board because it's only going to be the vulnerable students, it's only going to be the, the small, uh, you know, small subgroups of students that are going to be harassed and bullied and uh, treated differently or things like that. So, um, you know, looking at the questions, I, I, I love what um, Denise Brooks said about you know, reaching 100%. Because I think even if you have this survey, and I don't know what the percentages were, but even if you had 1% of the students that said that this is a concern, that's kind of huge when you think about there's only you're only expecting a, a minority of students to even respond to safety problems. So, um, any number above that low level is a high concern. So, um, if you wait, just so I can give you a perspective and get a chance to see it. So, um, the highest percentage from a student perspective was about physical appearance. That was at 29%. Um, race, ethnicity, skin color, 14%. Religion, 14%. Sex, 11%. Disabilities, 10%. Um, so, I'm just giving you political beliefs and physical appearance for the two highest at 29 and 25 percent and again i would agree with you even if it's 10 percent it's, it's, uh, it's, 
a number of students, and I think it's a concern to us that every student should feel comfortable being in, in school. Yeah, but like the big ones that are there, but, um, physical appearance, you claim not percent that's like that's yeah. Yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we said ethnicity. Uh, and political physical. beliefs was second. What? No, but I'm saying ethnicity and this is the race, race, ethnicity, and skin color. So if you think about race, ethnicity at 10 percent and disabilities at 10 percent, the percent of students that are going to be uh, racial differences and disability differences are probably, you know, I don't know the exact number of them, but I'm sure pretty close to being more like 5 percent and lower. So the fact that the responses are in the 10 percent already, and then we only have a 30 percent response rate. Um, so then related to that, the other concern that I have is that um, it seems like every solution to those categories was training and peace center. Um, and I think that's a huge miss. Um, I, I think it's great the training that we're doing. Um, you know, like like Katya said, uh, you see, you know, big improvement across the board, um, but it's only improving the administration and the staff where you're missing the opportunity to improve just the students themselves, um, and maybe even the parents. Um, and I think like the diversity committees, you know, like she mentioned, at the Newtown Elementary School, it's been awesome. There's been programs where uh, 100 to 200 people are attending, um, you know, uh, mixed up days and uh, different diversity related programs, different just acceptance type of programs. And it's just generating a lot of energy and a lot of just acceptance, awareness. The students are involved now in kind of driving the diversity committee work where um, your parents used to be, but now the students are putting up images of, you know, for Women's uh, Month, uh, for uh, different heritage months, the students are driving. And that's driving the students to be more accepting of different cultures. And that's what you want. Um, so the fact that, you know, you kind of only have one or two schools that are really strong in the diversity community piece, I think that should be kind of, you know, another solution. Um, there's other solutions that you can think of. I mean, for other areas of concern, there's a broader, you know, kind of broader group here things we can do to tackle this problem. But for everything that was, you know, bullying, harassment, and tolerance, it was training and peace center. And they so, can't be the solution. So, so I think that's a fair comment and interpretation. But I, I, the intent, and I want to make sure it's clear for folks here as well as for the public, the intent was before us making decisions about ways in which we could um, do better at educating our students or to roll out work with uh, school-based diversity committees, it was important for us to gain understanding. So the desire that I had in putting that collectively under the training was for us to gain a better perspective. So now as we plan programs and plan moving forward, we can do it um, much better because of what we have learned from the training we've gone through. So not that, not that that was the end result, that was the beginning for us to be able to plan moving forward. Right, and so, totally understand your point, but other things can be done in parallel. Because I think the training will be done until what, the end of 2019? No, we're, well, the, the administrative training is done. Everybody's been trained? Or? All of our entire administrative staff was trained throughout the fall for, yeah, so we're, that, that's what I meant. We're, we finished ours in May. Now we feel like we have a collective wide leadership in that area of the district. That's uh, so, and I hope this is going the wrong way, but that's maybe even more reason to say we should have some other solutions up there. Well, I think now we, have to, <laughs> we just finished it the last week of May, so we just wrapped up our training. So we haven't had time to, to get our acts together. Oh, everyone's good. Um, and then the, the other concern I had too was just the, um, the change from Hanover to, to Clarence. Um, oh, 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 is that oh, the C A L Q U A L C A L? Okay. Um, so one thing I remember, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, just my understanding of it, with Hanover, it's kind of, you know, they're kind of managing it, running it for us. And so it's kind of out of our hands, it's sort of the school district. So it's kind of like a third party. Managing the survey for for you, giving the results, the analysis, and everything. And I think I heard you say ultra, ultra, <laughs> ultra, uh, that um, that you would take more ownership of that. Kind of the how do you manage kind of not? Do we take ownership of the questions and the type of questions and 
what's contained in it, and what's available publicly, what's not available publicly. And the school district take ownership of all those factors of it too, or because I think that's kind of I don't want a third party to kind of help you take it outside of you. So our relationship with Hanover was a very good one. We were very pleased with their work. However, what we found was that um, because of the time that it takes for them to provide a, a product for us, um, for the cost, we completed two surveys. We did a um, climate survey and we did a transportation survey. And um, for those dollars, actually, one of the tools they use is Qualtrics. Qualtrics is a tool that Hanover employs, and I think even uh, Nisa, I think, had made mention she uses Qualtrics. So for us, the value was that we have opportunity to use that same tool, and Qualtrics has um, has folks that we can you know tap into to gain better understanding of questions and we have some you know expertise within the district both as employees as well as in the community um, to do this but we could run multiple surveys at multiple times we want to do a graduation survey to get a sense of what our kids feel like when they're leaving council rock how well prepared are they for you know the workforce how well are they prepared for post-secondary education that would have been something we would have done in Hanover, but we had the way they only do one uh, product at a time so we can have multiple products happening at the same time. And because we own them, we can then hopefully use them for some longitudinal, longitudinal look at stuff that would be difficult for us to do with uh, Hanover. So that was the purpose of the change. We may go back to Hanover if we're not pleased with Walsh, which we think we will be, but we haven't used it yet. So that was the, that was with, um, the impetus behind us switching vendors. I have a quick question because I love how you talk about the training that you went through. I'm just curious, what's your biggest takeaway from training and how do you see yourself implementing this, changing the way you teach, changing the way you administer? Me personally? Yeah. I, well, gosh, there, there's a number of things. I think the one thing that stuck um, very clearly for me was. Um, I mean, there's a lot of work about brain research, how and why people react and respond as they do, and how we can be better at serving folks. I think ultimately, um, the, the, the phrase that stuck in my mind is having people, whether you're dealing with um, people within the school district, um, teachers and, and other staff, whether you're dealing with parents, whether you're dealing with students, is making sure that they they feel safe out of being heard. But those three words, over and over again played out in my mind about safe, safe valued, and heard. Yeah. The, the making sure that you know every student in the school should feel safe, valued, and heard. Every parent should feel safe, valued, and heard. Every staff member should feel safe, valued, and heard. And a lot of the strategies that we had an opportunity and an opportunity of student credit, she found living strong. And, and and I was a little bit skeptical going into it, not knowing what the focus was. I walked away just, just very amazed at the quality of work that those people did. I, I'm going to apologize. We 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 actually have another meeting we have to have after this meeting. Um, it's an executive session topic. So if we've already called upon you at some point, it's it's good dialogue. But unfortunately, we have. It's just about how stage. They started in this district. Mm -hmm. That started in this district. No, I know that. They're, I mean, okay. They can have more of an impact. We know very okay. well. Nancy, you have not made a comment. So. Okay. Um, first of all, congratulations on having the support staff uh, trained because people don't realize they do more interface with students than teachers, in a way. They meet them on the bus, they're out there at recess, they're there at lunch, they're there all the times when they're troubles with the school. And I, I'm just, I'm so glad that you got them trained. Second of all, I think climate in a school, to me, the old school that I am, it relates to how welcomely a principal is to volunteers coming into school. and. Lately, we've seen some principals who really don't want any volunteers. So I, I think there needs to be a conversation about maybe 
what the district feels about that, not leave it up to each individual principal. Um, uh, lastly, uh, I'm so glad to join a graduation survey. Uh, I've been a proponent of that for years, and maybe uh, if even like a year out, because we don't keep track of like how many kids go to college and then drop out like for a year. And I think the most important thing about our education is what we graduate, what the graduates do. It's not where they go, but how they do it when they go. And lastly, I, I've known you for a long time, and there's nobody better to do this than you. You took over a school in Council Rock that was one of the worst school situations we've ever had. And you turned it around in a short six or seven months. And I thank you for doing that. Then I'm glad to be part of this, and I'll let you let go. Thank you, Mrs. Carroll. And hearing no others, this meeting is adjourned.